At 4-0, the Wayne Hills Patriots look to keep the train rolling to the coveted undefeated season. Their next challenge, a familiar foe in the Demers Norseman. With two stars out, Ray Van Peten and Mike Gallad. The role players will really be under the spotlight tonight. Wayne Hills, Demers, now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Patriot Stadium, where in today's North Bergen Interscholastic League football matchup, the visiting Denver's Norseman will take on your Wayne Hills Patriots. I'm David Suntup, alongside Andrew Guile and Spencer Ferdig. So guys, the Wayne Hills offense has just been fantastic this season. Despite the loss of Ray Van Peten, the offense has averaged 49 points a contest. Guys, how has this offense still been so dominant even without Ray Van Peenen? Well, the secret to the recipe, David, is the offensive line. They go out there consistently night in and night out practicing, and they just put great holes for the offense to run through. They make, they block people very well. It's consistent year after year, and it just comes from hard work during the summer and year-round. So it just shows you that the offensive line, you can build around it. And as Andrew Gallo just said, as a product of this great offensive line, the running game has really been able to flourish. A lot of people thought that in the absence of Ray Van Peen and the running game would take a definite hit. But Danny DeSico and Carlton Morrison have both seamlessly stepped in and filled his role, combining for over 800 yards in the ground on the past four games. When you're averaging over 200 yards on the ground each game, you're going to get it done night after night, and that's what the Patriots have been doing. Besides the Patriots having a dominant rushing attack, their passing offense has really been starting to click. In the last two games, Mike G and Papa are on combined three touchdown passes to Mike Fulham. So now that the passing offense is really rolling along, how great could this offense really be? Well, I mean, it was already dangerous previously, and now with the addition of Mike G and Papa really maturing at the quarterback position, it's dominant in all facets of the game. We got a great offensive line. Wide receivers who you could throw to anytime, and the running backs we saw as Spencer brought up Ray Van Peen in the absence of him, the backup running backs Dan DeSico and Carlton Marsha have filled in ni very nicely uh, to say the least. I mean, and the tight ends Scott Schultz very good and Kyle Hannenberg. So we just see there night after night with Mike G and Papa out there. This team is very dangerous. And the formula for having a good offense on a football team is actually very simple. You need a good running game and a good passing game. The running game has been established for years and uh, established itself very early in this season. But now the passing game, not necessarily to the surprise of many, but it's been uh, increasing in its efficiency and it, in its success game after game. And now with Mike Giampapa as a very reliable quarterback and with many threatening weapons on the field, the Patriots really have it covered on all sides of the offensive ball. Guys, switching over to the defensive side of the ball, the first team defense has now allowed one point the whole entire season. That is just absolutely incredible. How has the defense been so great, and how come no one's been able to score on this defense? Well, it's all the coaching, David. I mean, you got a group of men out there that have played together, most of them for the past four years. They know what their each other's strengths and weaknesses are, and Coach Olsen, we all know, he keeps his troops together. All, defensive line is phenomenal, absolutely. Maybe the linebacker's the best in New Jersey. Secondary, extremely strong. As we see, the, the first team has not given up points this season, and they've given up, the whole unit has given up 13 points s through four weeks. So we just see here that the defense, offense is great, but the defense is something special. And yes, David, you know, I think Andrew just brought up a really great point in the fact that these guys have been together for four years and playing with each other for four years and knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses really fosters a sense of unity on the team. And I really feel like these guys go out there and believe in each other and know what each other can do and will pick up the slack if one another is failing. And to that extent, I mean, they've, you know, the defense on all aspects of the defensive ball have really been strong this year. And that's another, you know, thing that adds to the greatness of this Patriots club right now. Switching over to the Denver side of the ball, in 2004, they played the Wayne Hills Patriots for the North One Group 3 State Championship. This year, they're 1-3, which includes losses to Mawa and Bergenfield on their home field. 
Why has Denver struggled so mightily this season? Because number six is sitting out for them. Mike Goulad has to be one of the best wide receivers in the state of New Jersey, and he's sitting on the bench with an ACL injury out for the season. Harrison Weiss, who else does he have to throw to? Not too many people, and Keith Esposito, is, Keith Esposito is very inexperienced as a running back. He's a junior. He's got talent, but he's inexperienced going against these big NBIL defensive lines, especially Wayne Hills, who's going to absolutely harass him tonight. Harrison Weiss has nobody to throw to. Glad's out. Offense struggles for Demarest. And, you know, high school's like a revolving door. In some years, your town congeals to form that great team as Demarest had experience with in 2004, and sometimes it doesn't. And unfortunately, they're experiencing one of those years. As Andrew attested to the fact that Michael Odd, number six, is not playing right now, so Harrison Weiss, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm repeating what he's saying, but that really is the key. He has no weapons to throw to on the field that have really proven themselves. And Keith Esposito isn't getting it done on the ground. So when your passing game isn't working and your running game's not working, it's going to be hard to score points, as Demarest has proven over the past four games. Guys, also, they lost Kenny Amzold, their senior running back last year, to graduation. And last year, he was probably the second best running back in the NBIL, and he was the motor behind that offense, and that's why their offense was so successful last year. Guys, thank you very much. And now, let's send it out to Matt Dubow on the sideline who has a report from with us. Matt, take it away. Thanks, guys. There's no new news here down on the field. Ray Van Peen is going to be out for his fifth straight week, which means the rushing game is going to fall into the hands of Carlton Marston and Danny DeSico. This should not be a problem, considering they have a combined 15 rushing touchdowns, which is ha which has allowed for Wayne Hills to really utilize the play action, allowing Michael G. and Papa to hit some of his larger receivers, like Mike Fulham and Scott Schultz. That's all for down here, guys. We're going to send it back up to the booth. And now we're going to take a look at the September 30th game of 2005 season, week four, Wayne Hills versus Demers. Let's see what happened there. Friday, September 30th, 2005, Wayne Hills Patriots, Demers Norseman. Mike Peichelite tries to get things started off early. He does a 21-yard touchdown pass to Nick Romeo to give the Patriots a 7-0 lead. Next play, give it to Super Ray. Number 21, Ray Van Peenen, one-yard touchdown run, gives the Patriots a 14-6 lead. Mr. Patience, Michael Peichel, rolls out to his right. He's looking for the end zone. He sees his big target, number 35, Scott Iowa Schultz, into the end zone, 21 to 12, Wayne Hills. Offense is something, but defense is something else for the Patriots. Pursuit here by Schultz, rushing Harrison Weiss to the right side. Weiss is looking for room. He throws down the sideline, thinks he's got Michael Lott, and nope, it is intercepted by number 11, Zach Mink. Such a sensational play by Zach Mink. Just look at the concentration by the young man who just recently graduated for the Patriots keeping his feet in bounds and picking off Harrison Weiss. Look at the capitalize on the interception. Ray Van Peenen takes it up the middle for a two yard touchdown run. 28-18 Wayne Hills and the capper for the Patriots. Mr. Peichel takes his troops to the line and he's gonna throw it to his man, number 19, Nick Romeo. Romeo takes it out to the right side on the bubble screen and all he sees is the end zone. Wayne Hills Patriots take this one 35-21 on Nick Romeo's touchdown. And now we're going to take a look at my interview with Michael G. and Papa on my daily show, one-on-one -on -one with number one. And welcome to this week's segment of one-on-one -on -one with number one. This week, Wayne Hills Patriots versus the Denver Norseman. Here to talk about with me, the quarterback, number one, Michael G. and Papa. Michael, 4-0, you're riding high right now. Demarest are coming in at 1-3. Mike Goulad out for the year with an ACL injury. How, what's your game plan going into this game to stop their offense? We really have to get at them early. Um, we need to take them out you know, before halftime like we always do. Um, we really have to just get in their heads. And, and our theme this week is just to play mistake-free football and just um, polish everything up and just make sure we're ready for next week as well. What you brought up being focused. and there, All these games so far have been lopsided. And most of the stars have only been playing a half. How do you stay focused in these games? Well, I think we, we just have to focus on the small things. I think the most important um, s practice of, of the week is definitely the Monday film session. Um, you know, when we, we all go in for the hour, hour and a half, and we really focus on all the small things. Um, you know, and that's, that's really what we have to do. If all the small things come, um, you know, come easy, then the big things just fall into place. The first team defense this year has not given up a touchdown, which is incredible for the first month of the season. How, how, do you, how are you going to keep that pace going against Harrison Weiss in this Demarest offense? Well, Harrison Weiss is definitely the best throwing quarterback we faced this year. So, you know, um, our D-backs have to be on their A game. They have to be playing good. Um, our linemen have to get pressure on them. 
and we really just have to stop the run, stop in the run, you know, make them one-sided, one-dimensional, and then the, you know our defensive backs have to play the game. Now you brought up stopping the run. Keith Esposito, no relation to the quarterback a couple of years back, Vinny Esposito. He's a very good running back, R.H. He's a junior. How's the, how are you guys going to stop him, and how's your line going to contain him? And if you don't, how are you going to contain Harrison Weiss? Well, he's, he, he's pretty good, the running back. Um, and their line, is they have a very, very big line. Um, but, you know, we just have to, we have to be more physical than they are. We have to use our speed. And our linebackers just have to play a good game. We have to stop their run and then let them throw the ball. Now let's throw a little to the offense before we leave here. You guys, you've been playing outstanding the past couple of games. Northern Highlands, you had a big game. Last game you had two touchdowns, both of Mike Fulham. How are you going to be out there in the pocket against this Demers defense that this year has been not really tested and they've lost all their games until last week when they won 6 nothing against Fairlawn. Well, I think we, we go out every week, same game plan, you know, get the run game started early, and then everything else just seems to open up the screens and, and you know, and, and the third down passes and stuff like that. So I think our game plan stays the same, especially this week. You know, um, we just have to be prepared for all their defenses, and, and, you know, our coaching staff definitely will have us prepared for that. Now, special teams, once again, I just want to bring this point up. Scott Iowa Schultz, who is 27 for 28 on extra points this year, how is his kicking on kickoffs and on extra points giving you the confidence that, okay, if you score a touchdown, he's automatically going to give us the points? You know, um, me being the holder, we, me and Scott have a pretty good relationship. You know, we're all, even on the offensive part, uh, side of the ball, we're always on the same page. And, um, you know, that one point really helps, um, maybe not in, in, in these games, but later down the road in a, in a, a closer game. This the one point, you know, really means to make, make or break the game. So, um, you know, you, have to, you always ask a question, the teams who lose by one, you know, ha how did that point really affect your, that season and the game? So, um, you know, that one point really makes a difference uh, for, for that game and for the rest of the season. Well, co communications, as you said, it's key, you know. If you go out there and your team's communicating well and you guys get along, you're going to win games. That's basically it. You're confident? Right. Okay. Best of luck. Thank go you. get them. Wayne Hills, Demarest Norseman on Channel 77, next. And welcome back to the Wayne Hills Demers football game. Now, let's send it up to Ernie Mezzi for tonight's starting lineups. The officials assigned to this game are members of the New Jersey Football Officials Association. The rules governing this game are the National Federation of High School Football Rules. These rules are different from rules used in college and professional football. And here are the officials assigned to tonight's game. The referee, Jim Baruti. The umpire, Mike Scarnio. The head linesman, Kevin McElroy. The line judge, Gary Marchese. The back judge, Bill Magna. And the clock operator, Bill Lapidula. And working the chain, the chains this evening, Al Ruffini, Rich Basilicato, Jack Zellner, and Jeff Basilicato. And ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our visiting team under head coach Scott Simonetti, the Norsemen of Demarest High School. And now to introduce the starting lineups for the Wayne Hills Patriots. Here is their starting defensive team. 
At defensive end, number 55, Dave Ogden, number 55. At defensive tackle, number 72, Matt Johnson, number 72. At defensive tackle, number 35, Scott Schultz, number 35. At defensive end, number 10, Kyle Hannenberg, number 10. At linebacker, number 20, Dan DeSico, number 20. At linebacker, number 40, Mike Fulham, number 40. At linebacker, number 34, Mike Masood, number 34. At linebacker, number 44, Mike Roman, number 44. At cornerback, number 22, Kevin Barakat, number 22. At cornerback, number two, Jeremiah Kale, number two. And at free safety, number five, Jeff Prezinski, number five. And captain number 21, Ray Van Peenen, number 21. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, This evening, Wayne Hills High School would like to welcome the eighth grade band members from the Schuyler Colfax and Anthony Wayne Middle Schools, who are guests of our own Patriot Marching Band. These young people will join in honoring America by playing the Star Spangled Banner along with our band. We ask that you now please rise as the Patriot Marching Band and their special guests from Schuyler Colfax and Anthony Wayne Middle Schools play our national anthem. Welcome back here to Patriot Stadium. I'm David Suntup alongside Andrew Guile and Spencer Furtick. So Wayne Hills just dominated in their first four games. They're four and out, and they're facing a Devers team that's really been struggling. They're one and three. They lost two games at home to really weak opponents, Mawa and Bergenfield. I know Mawa has gotten better this year, but in the past they've been weak. Why has Devers really struggled, and can they rebound tonight and put up a good performance, well, just especially like, on offense? Well, just like I mentioned in the pregame show, David, Mike Lodd's out, and 
Harrison White has really limited options to throw to. Keith Esposito's inexperienced in the backfield. He's not he's his first year starting, so he's not fully into the mode yet. So that's why the reason that Demers cannot put up points is because of the loss of Glock. The Demarest Norseman are going to have a lot of trouble rebounding tonight. Uh, it would be great for them to get on a roll, especially after the run of misfortune they've run into. But it's going to be hard to rebound against the Hills team that has proven so far this season to be far superior. Wayne Hills captains at midfield from right to left. Number 72, defensive tackle Matt Johnson. Number 40, linebacker slash wide receiver Mike Fall. Number 21, Ray Van Peden, who will not play this week. And number 55, defensive and off slash offensive guard Dave Ogden. Getting back to Denver, it's not only do they want to rebound from a rough start, in order to make the North one Group 2 playoffs, because now they're in Group 2, they basically have to run the table after this game. And it's going to be really tough because they have Wayne Hills, who's undefeated, and next week they play Passac Valley, who's also undefeated. And the week before the cutoff, they play Ramapo. So they definitely have their work cut out for them. And if Denver wants any chance in this game, they have to go out and score first. Against Fairlawn, Denver's Fairlawn only scored three, six three, points. The will kick off so the Patriots will kick off to start the game, and the Norseman will receive. In a nine game season, every game is critical, Dave, but this game, especially for the Norsemen, is critical because there's a large, large difference when you're trying to make the playoffs between starting two and three and starting one and four. Well, you have to think that Devers reads the newspaper and they look at the box scores. Devers only beat Farrell on six to nothing. When they see that Wayne Hills beat them, I mean, 49 to six or whatever it was, yeah, 49 to six, what do you think goes through Demers' mind? Do you think that gives them a lack of confidence coming into the game? Well, it definitely does give them a lack of confidence, David, but not only that, it gives them the mindset that, oh my God, this team that we're gonna play tonight has the possibility to really kick us in the rear end because 49 to 6, and then to lose to that same team that Wayne Hills beat is unacceptable. Also, Demers lost to Bergenfield 13 to 6, and Wayne Hills beat Bergenfield last week 42 to nothing. If they do have a lack of confidence, though, Dave, this Demers team isn't showing it yet. They looked pretty solid in warm ups. Number 4, Keith Esposito, and number 27, Keith Dooley, in the backfield to receive the kick for the Norsemen. Scott Schultz had 19 touchbacks back in 2005, only one touchback this season. He's really worked on putting more air time to his kicks. Schultz kick off to start the game. A nice high kick, fielded by Esposito about the four yard line. Esposito takes it up to the right, and he is tackled by a host of Patriots right around the 15 yard line. So I talked about in my interview with Carlton Marson, as you see Eddie Rolf coming off the field after making the tackle. This Wayne Hill special team unit has been really dominant. And one of the things that they've really succeeded in is limiting their opponents on kickoff returns, as you saw right there. Oh, absolutely, David. I mean, when you put your opponent in the position to not succeed driving down the field, let's face it, it's much easier to defend your opponent when they're pushed farther back on the field than when they have a good return. As Harrison Weiss brings his troops to the line, Mike Goulot, number six, their star receivers, out for the season of a tour in ACL. Esposito out of the backfield in motion. Weiss back to pass. He's looking for room, and he is stuffed by a host of Patriots. Nothing on that play, as there was a quarterback draw that was stopped by the Patriots. Good recognition there by the Wayne Hills defense. Excellent recognition there by the Wayne Hills defense and questionable play calling early on for the Denver's Norseman. David, I've talked to you this through the games many times early on this season, and one thing that has really come to me is what has the opposing coaches for the other teams that play the Wayne Hills Patriots, why is their game plan seem so obstruct? against these Wayne Hills Patriots. I mean, it seems like nothing works. Well, we saw the Northern Highlands game. First, they tried to throw deep, and Jeremiah Kyle did a great job on Tucker Michaels. And then, they can't run against this Wayne Hills defense because the D-line is so dominant. I formation, number 12 in motion, Matt Robertson. Weiss back to pass, handoff to Keith Esposito, and he is stuffed again by a host of Patriots. Never has can't seem to get anything going here so far in the first two plays. And speaking of number 12, Matt Robertson, he only has one arm. I believe he, the right arm is the only arm that he has. I'm not totally sure. I mean, that's very impressive to only play football with one arm. And 
Not only does he play with one arm, he plays wide receiver and quarterback. And he starts. And I think that's a good illustration of the fact that even though Demarest might not be exhibiting a lot of team success right now, in terms of personal player stories, they've got a lot of good things going for them. Third and 12 from their own 17-yard line. I formation. Chris Colkin, the tight end in motion. Weiss backs a pass. He's looking to his left. And the pass is over the head, incomplete, intended for the senior tight end, Chris Colson. Chris is incomplete. Chris Colson, excuse me. So now, Demers off the punt deep in their own territory as Carlton Marson and Dan DeSico are back deep to receive the kick. Going back to special teams, Carlton Marson and Dan DeSico have just done a stupendous job of returning Marson the kicks for the Wayne Hills Patriots. Matt Giannetti's punt. Matt Giannetti to punt the ball for the Norsemen. High snap handled by Giannetti. A short high kick. As the Seco lets it bounce. The Seco takes it out to the right. He's at the 35. He has blocking. The 20, 15, makes a great beat. And he's in for the touchdown. And there's a flag on the play there. I believe it's going to be penalized on the point after attempt. Danny DeSico, apparently the referee saw a little showboating. I didn't see it. Referee. Yeah, unsportsmanlike conduct, the call. Great run there by Danny. You saw that one as he let it bounce, and he actually, his blockers really made great blocks on the field, and that Deke at the end made the run. You know, in that set of plays by Demers really illustrated what Andrew was talking about before in terms of teams coming in here with a game plan and, uh, you know, really getting psyched up for this game against the Patriots to make a statement and it really just all falling apart. I mean, if that set of plays is a microcosm for what this game's going to be as a whole, their running game and passing game are both in big trouble tonight. A 15-yard Besides Wayne Hills being grand return, the they definitely have the talent of their return man in terms of Danny DeSico and Carlton Marston. But the blocking on that play was just great. Everyone just picks up a man and blocks, and Carlton Marston did a great job stalk blocking. Scott Schultz and take the extra point. And it splits the uprights, a 34-yard extra point by Scott Schultz. And now he's 28 for 29 on the season on Eight extra point seven. attempts. So guys, why has he improved so much in terms of his extra point percentage? Focus, David. It's all about being focused out there. Mike G and Papa talked to me on one-on-one -on -one with number one, and he told me that being the holder for the sky was Schultz. It was basically all about becoming more focused and just I'm going to kick it through the uprights. I'm going to kick it through the uprights. He has to have that mindset. Last year, sometimes it would slip his mind. He had a great, no, not to take anything away from his kicking last year. We saw those 19 touchbacks on kickoffs. But this year, as we saw, one extra point missed. Excellent job by Scott Schultz on improving his game. And Scott Schultz, he's always had the power, as we've known, but he's really practiced on his accuracy this season. And as that 28 of 29 uh, extra point attempts will tell you, it's really worked out for him so far. Going back to what you just said, we know he had the power, but now he has the accuracy on his extra points. On the kickoffs, he has more height and air time, so that gives the coverage team more time to get down the field. And Scott Schultz kicks off, as it is fielded by number 27, Keith Dooley in the end zone, and that's Scott Schultz's second that touchback of the season. The and that's zone. not a typo, only his second touchback this year after having 19 last year, because he really improved on the height of his kickoffs. And that's why opposing teams have had an average start position probably around the 15-yard line. Yeah, the focus, as I said, focusing again, was mostly on Schultz on the kickoffs, getting more air time under his kicks, which gave the return team, um, excuse me, the kickoff team more time to get to the return team to pin him inside the 20-yard line. 20-yard line is great, but in putting him inside the 20-yard line puts him at more of a disadvantage. I formation, hand off to Esposito to the right and he gets about two yards on the play. So Demers really hasn't had much of a game plan so far. They've tried to run up the middle to the right tackle spot. They haven't really tried to go down the field deep because they're missing Michael Lyons. What do you do in order to try to get something going against a defense like the Patriots? Because there really aren't any weaknesses on this Wayne Hills defense. Well, Harrison Weiss, I talked I talk to Michael on one-on-one, -on -one and he told me that he has the best arm in the NBIL, Harrison Weiss, so he maybe should use that a little more. Second and eight for the Norsemen on their own 22-yard line. I formation. 
Weiss back to pass, getting great pressure by Dave Ogden, and Weiss is forced to get rid of the ball as he just does before Weiss he's met by Dave Ogden. So it'll be third and eight on the Norseman 22-yard line. Harrison Weiss does have a great passing arm, and uh, it's just going to be very hard to use that arm when you're under the constant pressure that this Wayne Hills defense is providing at the moment. You know, as Andrew said, it would be great to be able to air the ball out there uh, and try to take advantage of a Wayne Hills secondary, but the secondary is very strong, and uh, you're not going to be able to get to take advantage of that if you can't get an accurate ball downfield, which isn't going to be possible with the way this defense is playing right now. Well, besides the D-line being so powerful, so talented, their secondary is also really talented. Jeremiah Kale, Kevin Barakat, Jeff Rosinski, they do a great job covering these receivers. So besides not having a lot of time, there's no one open. As the Denver Norsemen are going to use their first time out and try to talk something over. I think if you want to have any chance to get a touchdown against this Wayne Hills defense, you have basically three chances to get a first down because on fourth down you punt. So you have to move the ball a couple of yards at a time. You're not going to get too many big plays against this defense. What, do you agree, guys? Oh, absolutely, David. I mean, this team... If I'm Demarest right now, I'm feeling pretty discouraged because I came in here with a strong game plan to, you know, come and try to make a statement against Wayne Hills, and nothing's working at the moment. What I was saying was, David, that this team, that you, you can't take anything for granted if you're Demarest because... You're playing as a Patriots defense that basically is impeccable. That you have to get every opportunity that is out there. You have to take advantage of it. And right now, Denver is not. Guys, while I have a moment, I'd like to give you tonight's trivia question, which is brought to you by Wayne Hills High School. Study hard and get good grades. And the question is, who picked off Tony Esposito to steal the Patriots 2004 state title win at Demers? Answer coming up during the first quarter. So now it'll be third and eight from the Norseman 22 yard line as Harrison Weiss brings his troops to the line. Three wide receiver set. Weiss back to pass. He rolls out to his left. Getting chased by Matt Johnson. As the pass is intended for Keith Esposito, it's incomplete. So now Demers off the punt again. So after the first play, as now we're gonna. Sorry about that. We had some technical difficulties. But now. After Denver's first punt, Dan DeSico returned it for a touchdown. Now, do you think Giannetti is going to kick this punt out of bounds? Oh, I think he's going to kick it near the sideline. That doesn't mean he's going to kick it out of bounds. But I think the aim and the purpose for this right now for Mr. Giannetti is to kick it out of bounds. That, that's what I would do. See if your defense can match it up against the Patriots' offense. Another high snap handled by Giannetti. A high, deep punt. Handed by the Seagull about the 43 yard line. He eludes a defender, tries to cut it to the left. Makes another move and he's cutting back to the right. A great block by Jeremiah Chaos. There's a flag on the play. Seagull's at the 40. He's got room up the right sideline. The 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Patriots. Dave the Seagull on his second part return for a touchdown. This is a flag on the backfield. This one could be coming back. Not only are the major things killing Demarest, like the fact that they can't establish any offensive game, but even these high snaps are really hurting their punting game as they try to pin the Patriots far downfield. Giannetti made a better job of turning that high snap into a more efficient punt than last time, but still, he's not getting any help from the snapper at this point. Well, at this point, he's not getting help from his own team, let alone Dan DeSico is running all over the place. Now, let's head out to the sideline as there's a block in the back. As Matt Dubow has a report for us. Matt, take it away. Thanks, guys. During the last change of possession, I was able to pull defensive end Kyle Hannenberg off to the side and ask him what some of the major keys tonight to stop the offense for the Norsemen would be. And he said this, that really, you know, everyone's been concerned with the running game. But since their running game's been so poor, if they could effectively rush the pass and cause them to make them run, then they would really be able to shut down the offense for the Norsemen, making the quarterback scatter. That's all from down here. I'll try to keep my ears open and see if I can get any secrets. Back up to you guys. Thank you very much, Matt. As the flag was at the 37-yard line of the Patriots, so the Patriots are taking back there. I think it was a block in the back. I, as I believe there's another penalty, I think it's probably false start, and it is false start. So County's really hurting the Patriots here on the last couple of plays. Five yard I just see the Wayne Hills cheerleaders trying to cheer on their football players. And now I'd like to give you the answer to tonight's trivia question, 15. which was brought to you by Wayne Hills High School. Study hard and get good grades. The question was, who picked off Tony Esposito to seal the Patriots' 2004 state title win at Demers? If you said Toby Totolo, 
You are correct. Back to the action now. Patriots are up seven to nothing. 8.31 here left in the first quarter. Jipu, pay off the Morrison as he is taken down by a host of Norsemen. Number 71 for Denver is Daniel Yi down the play. And they have a big defensive front, the Norsemen. Daniel Yi, as you mentioned, who played on the, the, chi the team that went to the title game in 2004. He was a big boy back then as a sophomore. I mean, this team has basically played together for a while now. It's just that the loss of Gulat has really killed this team in the offense and defense. Dan DeSico and Carlton Morrison will have to carry the rushing load for another week. Last year, against the Norsemen, Ray Van Peen just had a fantastic game. He had something like 238 rushing yards and two touchdowns, just a monster game. Gene Papa back to pass, goes down the field, and it is caught by Scott Schultz. He's at the 50, and he is taken down at the Norseman 48 yard line. What a great one handed catch by Scott Schultz. And Jeepu really, in the past couple of weeks, has improved his game so much he is taking it to another level. Michael has played to over his potential because a lot of people coming into this season said, Mike, all you have to do is hand the ball to your backfield. But you know what? He's done a lot more than that. He's passing the ball effectively. He's making very smart decisions, just like his person that he took over for, Mike Peichel, did. And he's just playing at an all-time low right now, throwing the ball really well, and seeing the field as good as I've ever seen him. And watching Mike Giampapa pass, I can't help but remember Mike Peichel from last year. He throws with the same efficiency, though not as much as he does not as much as he like. Jim Papa tosses it out to number five, Jeff Brzezinski, for about an eight-yard completion. So it'll be about second and two on the Norseman 40-yard line. What I meant to say before with regard to Mike Jim Papa, and I'm not sure if this came across clearly, was the fact that he reminds me of Mike Peichel and the fact that while the Patriots offense is centered in the run game, when called upon, Mike Jim Papa, you know, answers that call very effectively. He's been very effective as this season is worn on, just as Peichel was last year, and really gets whatever job he's required to get done, done. So it'll be about second and two on the Norseman 40 yard line. Boom, split right. The Seco in motion. Wide receiver sweeped at the Seco, and he is taken down at about the, the Norseman 46 yard line. Great play on defense by Chris Colsar. And the early going, it looks like the Denver's defense has really come out with some swagger, I guess you could say. Scott Rubinetti, the head coach, I guess has really installed something in his troops this evening that. I haven't seen any opposing defenses this year. I mean, right now, it looks like the Patriots, but the running game has no answer for the defense right now. And the Demers defense is the strong point of this team. They've only let up 54 points in the past four games, which isn't too bad a stat line, if you ask me. Ball and Barricat split left. Sequel split right. Gian Papa back to pass. As the pass is out of the reach of Carlton Marson. So now, the Wayne Hills Patriots off the punt. We haven't seen this too often, especially early in the game, as you see Coach Olsen talking to Mike G and Papa. I believe Coach Olsen is telling Mike G and Papa that he had to wait a little bit longer to let the play develop so Carlton Marson had more room to make the play. So the sequel will punt for the Patriots. And he stresses excellence, Coach Olsen. There's no question about that. as a nice high punt by Danny DeSico. As it takes a Norseman bounce, as it's touched by Mike Fulham at about the Norseman 18 Mike yard line. Fulham. Norseman take over as there's 545 here Carolina left in the first quarter. Wayne Hills defeating the Denver's Norseman seven to nothing. Danny DeSico had about a 55-yard punt return for a touchdown. Not actually sure how long the punt return was. Actually, if they were sure of that, it may have been like 42 yards. I'm not totally sure, but that's how Wayne Hills got on the board. And then he had another great punt return, but it was taken back by a block in the back. Weiss back to pass as he completes it to number 27, Keith Dooley. Weiss's pass is complete to Keith Dooley. Jeremiah Kale on the tackle. Back Jeremiah, who's very, Jeremiah let's just say he has football instincts. He's a very good athlete, Ruben. Jeremiah, and he just goes out there night in and night out. He knows the game very well. And that, his knowledge of the game is a great asset. 
One of the reasons that this Demarest offense has had such a hard time kickstarting is in the absence of Goad. No one's really been able to step up. And the problem with this Demarest offense is that they do lack depth. Um, the Patriots were able to replace Ray Van Pien because of the depth they have on offense, and Demarest just doesn't have the same kind of depth. I formation for the Norsemen, second and five from the 23-yard line. Weiss hands it off to Keith Esposito. Nice cut by Esposito as he's at the 40, 45, and he is taken down at about the 49-yard line. Good run there by Keith Esposito, because that's the first big hole the Northern rushing attack has gotten tonight. Good run by Keith Esposito, but a great tackle, touchdown saving tackle there by Kevin Barakat. If Kevin Barakat missed that tackle, he would have, Keith Esposito, this game would have been tied up at seven, but Kevin Barakat, whose brother I work with, Brian Barakat, good man. But great tackle there by Kevin. I don't know if Keith Esposito heard our pregame doubts about him, but clearly he went out there right now to prove us wrong. I mean, that was an impressive run. Like I've said before, Wayne Demarest has really had a tough time running the ball this season. That's one of the reasons why they're one and three. I have formation for the Norsemen, first and 10 from the 48 yard line. Weiss the late hand off to Esposito as he runs it up the middle for about a four yard gain. So it'll be about second and six. Nice play call in there from the Norsemen. I think they have a microphone up here, the Norsemen uh, coordinators, because they heard me criticize Rubinetti's play calling in the early going. And now all of a sudden they're just coming out and he's looking like a football guru. I don't know what's going on. As you see the shot of the Patriot faithful there that was previously on your screen. And now you see the Demers faithful on your screen. Not a lot of Norseman fans here tonight. They have a great a band chilly though. night here at Patriot Stadium. As number 12, Matt Robertson in motion. Weiss hands off to number 23 for the Norseman. As he scampers ahead, I believe he's close to the first Malone down. The As number 23, A.J. Malone on the carry. A little fullback handoff there. It looked like it was going to. It looked like Weiss was going to give it up to Esposito, but again, he gave it up to number 23, the fullback, Malone. No relation to Ron Malone. Dave, you alluded to the weather before, and that's not a factor we've really had to talk about that much this season, but on a chilly night like this, it could play a big role. Weiss hand off to Esposito up the middle for about a five yard gain. So Demarest is running up the middle effectively on this drive, and that's why they've been able to extend this drive on a couple of occasions. Now, so it'll be about second and five on about the 30, 34 yard line. David, this Demarest team is one and three, but right now it doesn't look like they're a one and three team. It reminds me of the Demarest teams from the past. What do you think was wrong in the first four games for this team? Well, they weren't able to move the ball on offense. They definitely played solid on defense, but when you can't score points, you can't go out there and have confidence. Weiss toss to Esposito, he breaks a tackle as Mike Masson takes him down on the backfield for a loss. Great play by Mike Masson to make a great tackle on the backfield for a loss. Jefferson's also in on the play. And that stellar play by Masson shows the resiliency of this Wayne Hills defense. You know, this is an unfamiliar position for them to be in, watching the team move downfield on them. And just when it looks like Demers might be getting on a roll, Masson comes in with a tackle that definitely at least helps stop the momentum of Demers' drive. So this is a huge possession here for the Demers Norsemen. They're finally in Patriots territory. It's third and 10 on the Patriots 37 yard line. So what do you think Denver should do here? All right, I'll throw the ball. They have to throw the ball. Yeah, I mean, there's a four wide receiver set. Trip split right. As Demers is going to use their second timeout. And Rubinetti's very upset. He is screaming in frustration. Something is going on. He, he's yelling at the referee actually. He is very frustrated. Freshman and JV well, this is a big play here as you see the Norseman marching band looking on. You never know if you're Demers how many times you will have an opportunity like this to extend the drive in Patriots territory. But if I'm a Norseman, I don't want to have third and long against the Patriots. This defense of the Patriots is just too good. And the chances of converting a third and long against this Wayne Hills defense is basically slim to none. And the fact is, they've established a much better running game, at least up to this point in the game, than a passing game. But do you really want to run it for third and 10? Because if you don't get a breakthrough run, then you're looking at fourth and long. And that's not something you want to be looking at in Patriots territory. Well, Demers has only had one run over 10 yards in this game. That was Esposito's long scamper earlier in this drive. And if you're Demers, you've had trouble running the ball the whole year. On third and 10, why would you run the ball? You have to, you have to go to the air. And I think Wayne Hills knows this too. 
As you see Coach Olsen talking to his defense. He's probably telling the D-line, get good pressure, get to Harrison Weiss, make him uncomfortable. And then and the corners will do their job with good coverage. Jeremiah Kale, Kevin Barricat, and Jeff Brzezinski. Just joining us, Ready I'm David Suntup alongside Andrew Guy and Spencer Furtick. Two minutes and six seconds here left in the first quarter of play. The Wayne Hills Patriots are defeating the Denver Norsemen seven to nothing. Third and 10 from the Wayne Hills 37 yard line. Weiss in shotgun formation. Esposito on the backfield. Trip split right. Weiss back to pass. He goes right across the middle of the field and is incomplete. Pass intended for number eight, Chris Colsar. Chris Colsar was wide open in the middle of the field, but Harrison Weiss was just not able to connect. That's a pass, if you're a quarterback, that's a pass you have to complete. Well, absolutely, on third down and your team driving here, calling for a rally, you gotta make that pass. No question about it. And it looks like Weiss is going out there. They're going for it, David. They're not taking a chance. I mean, well, they are taking a chance, a very big chance. You have to go for it here. First of all, Wayne Hills can score from anywhere. And if you're Denver, you may not get many chances in Wayne Hills territory. Four wide receivers set. Weiss. Oh. That was the Doug Flutie play a couple that years ago. That was not a smart play. As Weiss punts it away, they're probably Weiss about, punt goes out of who bounds. knows how many yards, probably about like eight. That, that was, was a, not that a was smart a, play. Well, it was a setup play. It was, it, they converted it, it the way. They didn't anyone. Well, they wanted it that way, though. And that really is an unfortunate cap to what has been a successful drive with less than two minutes left in the first quarter. The Patriots have their smallest first quarter lead of this this season, and Demarest really had a lot of momentum going to this drive. And to end it like that, it's kind of a downer. There's been a definite momentum shift. Well, if you're Demarest, why wouldn't you just punt it into the end zone? At the worst, they have it at the 20-yard line if you, if you kick it into the end zone. They were hoping that it would hit off a Patriot maybe and cause a fumble. That I think that was it. Yeah, but the chances of that are usually slim. Hale to DeSico to the right side. Dan DeSico still going as he is slammed down at about the 34-yard line. The so it'll be second and six for the Wayne Hills Patriots. Eight, Not giving up is something that Dan DeSico, it's in his vocabulary. He just keeps going. He gets hit, and he runs they out to the outside five, until he gets tackled. When you look up the five. word resilient in the dictionary, Dan DeSico is under that definition. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I've okay. seen it before. Okay. First of all, even though that punt return was called back as a penalty, he ran all the way to the left side of the field. I believe he broke a tackle and then came all the way back to the right side of the field and took it for a touchdown, even though the punt was called back. Hey, out the seat goes to the left as he's taken down about the 36-yard line by a host of Norsemen. The the <laughs> so it'll be about 35 from the 35-yard line. As Wayne Hills has really had trouble running the ball so far in this game. As you see the clock, 47 seconds here left in the first quarter. Now David, third down here. Carlton goes in there, now checks in. Mike G and Papa right now, what do you think Coach Olsen just told him? Do you think, you're throwing, do you think it's going in the air? I think it's going in the air. I think so too, I look for Mike Fall because he's the playmaker in the wide receiver court. And he's tall, he's 6'5", he can get up there and catch the ball over these smaller cornerbacks. Jim Papa, shotgun formation. Jeepu back to pass, makes the handoff to Marson. Jeepu's looking down the field, and he is slammed down to the grass by number eight, Chris Colsar. Great play there by Chris Colsar to end the Patriots drive as the first quarter comes to an end. Seven nothing after the quarter, and it was a brutal quarter, literally for the Patriots. I mean. After that touchdown on the punt return, they really they could not get anything started on offense. I think Scott Rubinetti had to say something to that Denver's defense. Now let's send it to the tape of highlights from the North Run Group 3 state championship of the 2004 season, Wayne Hells at Denver. Warzell under center. Jim Pop and Tolo in the backfield, I form. Colin Wiseman in motion towards the bottom of your screen. Warzel is going to pass. No, he's not. He's going to give up the middle to Tolo, who has a huge hole. He's across the 50, cuts it outside to the 40. He has the sideline, and he is knocked end over end. First down and 10, ball on the Demarest 11. Warzel under center, give to Tolo. Tolo has a hole, and he's going to walk into the end zone untouched. Toby Tolo. Warzel only one for two on field goals this year, only attempted two. His one hit throws from 30 yards. This is a 20 yard and Warzell's take plenty of leg and it splits the upright swing. Eight in the day, he's ready to go. 
effort. Let's go back and pass. Excellent protection all the time in the world. Looking downfield, looking for Van Peenen. Triple covered. Sticks it in there. Flags on the play. Van Peenen ahead to the 20. Looking for the sideline. He's across the 10 near the goal line. Dives. Touchdown, Ray Van Peenen. Flag on the play. And they've got the lead pending. Well, they're tied right now. They could have the lead pending this extra point by Nick Warzel. Warzel sets with up the extra point. The hold is good. Warzel's extra point splits the uprights. Wayne Hills leads Demarest 17 to 6. Four wide receiver set. Esposito under center. Esposito back to pass. Good protection. Steps up. And that is intercepted at the five yard line. That's Toby DeTolo. DeTolo takes it across the 20. Down at the 22 yard line. And that is absolutely huge. Toby DeTolo intercepts it. All but seals a Patriots victory. Ball game, folks. That's it. The Wayne Hills Patriots are your 2004 North 1 Group 3 state champions. After a Dan DeSico punt, Demers will take over on the Patriots 39 yard line. Weiss back to pass, makes the handoff to Esposito. As the pass is batted down by I believe Mike Fulham or Dave Ogden, not sure which one. Dave Ogden and Mike Fulham brought a lot of pressure there to Harrison Weiss. In the first quarter, Demers had a good plays with a lot of clock management and a lot of misconception by Demers, a lot of draw plays, but they worked to no avail. And David, I, I've just seen a momentum shift in this ball game. I have not seen the Patriots look stymied out there. I mean, I've never seen it like this before, this season. Actually, the past two years, I haven't seen something like this. Well, I saw it in the Rampo game last year, the first Rampo oh, game, yeah. but then you know what happened in the second half of that game. We know. Second and 10 from the Patriots' 39-yard line as there's a flag on the play. As the refs confer. But you know what, David? As it's offside on the Norseman. Actually, illegal procedure on the Denver's Norseman. That will back him up five yards. If you want to beat Wayne Hills, you can't have penalties like this because, especially against the defense of the Patriots caliber, it's hard enough to score points. But when you keep shooting yourself on the foot like that, it's going to be a long night. Harrison Weiss also needs to be smart with the ball. Thus far this game so far, he has been smart with the ball, and Demers needs to have clock management. In order to beat this tough Wayne Hills team, they need to be smart with the football, run it with Keith Esposito, and have to open up big holes. So now it is second and 11 from the Patriots 44 yard line. Weiss rolls out to his right. He's looking to run it, and he is taken down by Dan DeSico as a flag comes flying onto the field. Weiss on the carry, tackled by Dan DeSico. Not sure who the flag is on. There is a flag on the play. As we will find out from PA announcer Ernie Mezzi. Block in the back against Demarest. As there's a block in the back against Denver, so that will knock them back even more yards as Denver is just shooting themselves in the foot right now. Well, absolutely, Dave. I, just as I was talking about the momentum shift, it looks like everything's going back into Wayne Hill's favor because what I was going to say before, before you said about the call, Wayne Hills, their players are cool and collected under pressure. We know Coach Olsen installs that during all their workouts that you got to be cool and calm, and if you're not, you're going to choke, but... We know the Patriots players, they don't choke. It's not in their vocab. They don't know what it is. They never heard of what choke is. So it's third and 25 for the Denver's Norsemen. They are backed up to their own 43-yard line. So this will be really hard to convert for Denver's, especially with a team that lacks big play potential. They're more about the small plays and picking up first downs with smaller plays. Yeah, huge loss, as you mentioned earlier in the game. Mike Goulard out with the ACL injury for the whole season. So they don't have that big target downfield. Mm -hmm. That's why they're gonna look to run with Keith Esposito and look, and look for Cooley to get a lot of passes tonight. Next week. We all know that Harrison Weiss has the arm. We saw that last year here at Patriot Stadium, but when you don't have the wide receivers to throw to, it's kind of hard. Weiss hand out to Esposito as Coach Scott Rubinetti plays a conservative as Denver will come out to punt. No, that was second down, and there's a flag. It's now, a third down. No, now score. it's third. They just switched it to third. The scoreboard is really. The scoreboard down. really That's is less than stellar, ladies and gentlemen. Down. And there was a flag on the play. David, I was not trying to question your intelligence. Yeah, I, I just saw because I saw second down previously. So. I would never do that to you, David. Yeah, I know. I know Very smart are. man, you know. 
I know you since back in the day from the Young Men, Young, young Women Hebrew women. Association Nursery School. Kindergarten in Richmond. Yeah. yeah. That was good times. The clock's still going. Oh, now they stopped it. As we're at a break here, let's talk about first quarter breakdown. Danny DeSico and Carlton Morrison haven't been producing their huge numbers that they usually produce day in and day out. Loss of yards for Carlton Morrison on the first drive. And DeSico has been getting his usual big returns. He got one return, and then he had one punt return called back by a block in the back call on Jeremiah Kale. As I believe possibly 10 extra seconds rolled off the clock because they forgot to stop the clock. As there's another block in the back by the Demarest Norseman, so another 15 yard penalty. And if you're Coach Scott Urbanetti, he's gotta be furious with his team. Actually, it's unsportsmanlike conduct. Demarest was usually was at the Wayne Hills 45, and now they're all the way back at the Wayne at the Wayne Hills 15, at their own 15. So two penalties on that play, a block in the back, like I said earlier, and unsportsmanlike conduct. If you're Scott Rubinetti, you have to be furious with your team. It's Denver has started this drive on the Patriots' 39-yard line. Second and 45. Second and a, a country mile. This is unheard of. I've never heard of a second and 45 ever going in football. Actually, in Madden, I had a second and 56 once because I'm absolutely awful at Madden. I was the Jets, and it just didn't work out for me. That's a story for a rainy day, though, my, me and my Madden career. John Brandle, actually, one of the best Madden players in the Western Hemisphere. So if you want to play him, you'll probably lose. He's playing right now against gym teacher Rich Basilicato Jr. So I'll, we'll get updates for you from our man, Michael McHugh, who will be with us later. Are you a pro sports fan? Then watch the 30-minute drill on Channel 77 with our own Jason Oliphant. Aaron Plaschik, Jake Soberman, Sean Yu, Carlton Marson, Dan Cohen, and Michael Botwinick. It's a weekly show. It's a fantastic show. And Jason Alfa is taking over in the footsteps of some greats, Chad Cutler, David Sontag, Andrew Guile. So, Jason, what's it been like to be host of the 30-Minute Drill? It's been great. You get to talk and discuss sports and a variety of topics, and it's great to be filling in the shoes of the great Dave Sontag and Chad Cutler and one-on-one -on -one with number one host, Andrew Gallo, of course. Oh, Jason, you I know I love the, the compliments. It's just an honor. It's an honor to hear all these compliments out of your mouth. David, first thing that comes to mind, the bubble that the Wayne Hills Patriots helmet. First thing that comes to mind, first thing. Prestige. First thing that comes to mind, Notre Dame theme song. Oh, I love the Notre Dame theme song. We're editing in the control room. <laughs> Andrew and I always dance to this song. Sometimes I actually sing to this song. He does uh, sing. Great times. Tim Fewer. Waller's favorite college football team, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. So Tim Waller, also a huge fan of this song. So now it'll be second and 45 for the Norsemen as they are backed up to their own 18-yard line. I formation. Weiss back to pass, and he's going deep up the left side of the field. Great play by Jeremiah Kyle Weiss to knock that ball down, as the pass was intended for number 27, Keith Dooley. Great coverage there by Jeremiah Kyle batting down the pass, nothing there for Demarest. And just a little underthrown there by Weiss, but as you said, Jason, Jeremiah Kyle read it extremely well, and he stood there and batted it down. I'm sure Demarest coach Scott Rubinet does not have too many plays in the playbook for second and 45. But in that situation, you have to try to go down the field and pick up a decent amount, as long as you're not making a bad throw into a double or triple coverage. And right there is one-on-one, -on -one. they're testing Jeremiah Kyle, and he made a great play. So now it'll be third and 45 from the Norseman 18 yard line. Weiss in shotgun formation. Weiss back to pass. And he's gonna punt it. What is Scott Rubinetti calling? As Mike Roman just bobbled the ball, but he picked it up. Talk about unique play calling by the Demarest Norseman. Fourth and 10, Demarest went for it on a punt earlier, and now they punt for it on a third and 45. Very, a lot of misconception by Demarest. Now well, let's send it down to the sideline. 
where Matt Dubell has an interview with Eric White. Matt, take it away. Thanks, guys. I'm standing here with a loyal Wayne Hills football fan, Eric White. Now, Eric, if you would have came to a Wayne Hills game, say the past, any of the past two home games, this time into the game, it would have been a blowout in favor of Wayne Hills. Now, the score is only 7 nothing. Why isn't it a blowout like in the past weeks? I don't know. After watching some of this game, Wayne Hills really hasn't developed their offense yet. You know, their run game hasn't been as solid as it used to be. Uh, their passing game's a little lacking right now. But I'm sure they'll get their act together, you know. They'll get back on track. It'll be 45-0 uh, by the end of the game. There you go. Straight from football analyst Eric White. Wayne Hills, you got to get the offensive machine rolling. Back up to you guys. Matt, thank you very much. That was just a fantastic run by Carlton Marson. He broke it out to the left side of the field, jumped over a defender, and that's the Patriots' first big rush of the game. Now it's first and 10 from the Norseman 26-yard line. What a vertical leap there by Carlton Marson over Howard Rim, the big senior. The Seco in motion. As Carlton Marson is stuffed in the backfield by number 71, Daniel Yee. So now it'll be second and 10 from around the 26 yard line. Wayne Hills can't have that happen. The offensive line hasn't been providing that much effort today. Carlton Marson and Dan DeSico getting stuffed. Actually, there was a loss in the play of about two yards. So now it's second and 12 from the 28 yard line. Fulham split left, Barricat split right. I formation. Jipu back to pass, rolls out to his right. And he completes it to Scott Schultz. And he is down right around the first down marker. Scott Schultz, a second reception of the game. Another big one earlier at a 35 yard reception. And now this one, a big 15 yard reception. Wayne Hills is definitely utilizing their big tight end and Scott Iowa Schultz tonight. I've always talked about in the past that the Patriots could really run the ball effectively like they have this season. They could utilize the play action and look for Scott Schultz. And in this game, Scott Schultz has been wide open and he's a big target and he could catch balls over the middle of the field and get a decent gain after the catch. And that's what he's done here tonight. So it'll be third and three for the Patriots on the Norseman 20 yard line. Hey out the Seco to the left. He's got room, he's at the five. Touchdown Patriots. There's a single on a 20-yard touchdown run, and the Patriots take a 13-0 lead. Great block there by number 63, Andrew Perea, and number 72, Matt Johnson. Great run by Dan DeSico. He is just doing, having a great game yet again, again for the Patriots. Absolutely. Dan DeSico on the sideline. Great run there by Danny DeSico. He just took off and a great block by Kevin Barakat, which led the defensive back in, more into the inside of the field, which led made the outside of the field completely open. So that's the Seco's second touchdown of the game. Schultz had kicked the extra point as it splits the upright for a 14 to nothing lead. As you see Coach Olsen talking to Dan DeSico. And now we have Hughes corner here with the legend, Michael McHugh. Michael, welcome to the show here. We got 14 nothing with 8.25 remaining in the second quarter. Thoughts about the game in the early on? Well, Andrew, this is much more than I expected. I, I thought it was going to be pretty much of a blowout, but right now it is a, a pretty tight game. You know, normally it's about like 28 nothing now. I'm, I'm staring, I'm, I'm watching the cheerleaders, see if they come up with any new dances or anything, but you know, tonight is a different story. Daniel Yee, who is six foot, 240 pounds, he's a big boy on this Denver's defensive line. How have you you seen his presence take part in this contest? Well, tonight I, I've de we've definitely seen his presence, and um, both Carlton Marson and Daniel DeSico, they have not been able to run the ball up the middle. You know, they've been stopped pretty much every single time, only getting a game at most of like four or five yards. And now. What, quickly before we go, what's your prediction for the outcome? For the outcome of this game, I'm gonna have to say, I'm I'm the I'm expecting a shutout from these Patriots tonight. I'm gonna have to say, around 28 to 31, nothing. Thank you, Michael. You're, You're it's welcome. always a pleasure. You having a good night, Andrew. Thank you. You too. As a short kick by Scott Schultz, returned by number 27, Keith Dooley. So that was Dan DeSico's 10th rushing touchdown of the season. He also has a touchdown on defense 
and he had a touchdown tonight on special teams. So that gives Dan to single 12 touchdowns on the season. He just had such a phenomenal season in all three facets. As you see, Tim Waller on your screen, who's played a great game on defense so far. Weiss, toss to the right to Esposito. As Esposito is taken down by a host of Patriots, Mike Fulham, Mike Bissett, Kyle Hannenberg in on the play. Great defensive pursuit by the Patriots there, as you saw rushing in. Mike Masood, great tackle there. And if the Patriots continue to play like this, it's not going to be a game anymore. Yeah, Mike Fulham's fourth tackle of the game. as Mike Fulham has just been a stud on defense this year. He's really done a great job tackling the ball carrier. He has three sacks on the season. 25 tackles and three sacks coming into this game. As there's a quarterback draw for Harrison Weiss, Harrison as he gets a gain of about four defense. yards, so it'll be about third and five at the about the 30 yard line. Demarest likes to do that a lot, a lot of quarterback draws with Harrison Weiss and also like I said earlier a lot of misconception and a lot of draw plays trying to catch the Wayne Hills defensive line off guard. Third and six for the Denver Norseman. 7.09 here left in the second quarter. I'm David Sato alongside Andrew Guile and Jason Alfont. Weiss back to pass looking to the right side of the field as the pass is dropped by number eight, Chris Colsars. He is hit hard by, I believe, number 40, Mike Fulham. I believe it's gonna be an early hit call by Mike Fulham. The ball didn't get to him yet, Mike Fulham hit him. As Mike Massoud broke up that play, excuse me, as there's a flag against the Wayne Hills Patriots. as the refs are going over the call. An unusual thing in tonight's game, a lot of penalties called on Wayne Hills. You don't see that too often, but tonight, for some reason, the Wayne Hills defense have been guiding a lot of penalties called on them. So the penalty is on Wayne Hills as the refs have spotted the ball at the 35 yard line. As now the ref is going over to the Wayne Hill sideline to talk it over with Coach Olsen. As Harrison Weiss comes back onto the field. Dave, as we have 6.51 remaining in the second quarter, are you worried that Wayne Hills isn't lighting up the scoreboard and that Demarest has been getting a lot of good drives thus far in the game but getting no scoring, getting no scores on the scoreboard? Well, last week against Bergenfield, Wayne Hills only scored seven points in the first quarter and they were only up 21 to nothing. As Weiss hand off to Esposito, and he is slammed down the backfield by Mike Fulham, and the Norse will be forced to punt. A great play on defense by Mike Fulham as he comes storming into the backfield to take down Esposito for a loss. And there was great pursuit by the Patriots there on the defensive line. Mike Fulham just burst through the offensive line and got to the runner, Keith Esposito, and just took him for a loss. Mike Fulham is what you call a defensive playmaker. When you need a play to be made, Mike Fulham is always there to make the play. And as you saw there, third and one for the Norsemen. They try to run it with Esposito as Mike Fulham slams in the backfield for a two yard loss. High snap as Giannetti punts it deep. Handed by the Seco about the 35 yard line. The Seco cuts it out to the left side of the field and he's taken down at about the 47 yard line. The Seco on the punt return. I'm still a little surprised that Demarest is not trying to punt the ball out of that. Are you guys surprised? Oh, I'm very surprised because he's so dangerous on the punt returns that you're just shocked at why wouldn't they kick it out of bounds. I don't know, the question stifles me, but back to the game here. I mean, we look at this drive now for the Patriots, this is so key for the Norsemen to, to not give up points on the board because if you're dealing down 21 close to halftime, you're basically, you're in deep trouble. So this possession for the Patriots, for the, this defensive possession for the for the Norsemen is extremely vital. Jipu in shotgun formation, two wide receivers split right, Barakat in the slot. Jipu back to pass, goes over the middle of the field for Scott Schultz. 
Jones at the 35, and he is taken down at the 28 yard line. Pass up the middle the third reception tonight for Scott Jones, as you see him get up after that reception. So I really like the Patriots game plan here in terms of the passing attack. Going to Scott Jones over the middle of the field. He's been open and he's gotten great gains after the catch. And he signaled to the viewers at home that was a first down. As you see the shot of us, as we're on camera right as now. As you see you me know. waving to the camera. Eddie Tuminello next to me too waving. Eddie Tuminello wearing a number 27. Brandon number tw Jacobs. Well, I couldn't see the number. Hand up to DeSico off the middle of the field as DeSico scampers to the 20 yard line. Going back to the last play, Scott Schultz has just been great this game. And Mike Giapapa showed a lot of showed a lot of presence in the pocket. Great play there by Gipu. Had a lot of time. Threw it to his tight end, Scott Schultz. Great play overall. Now Wayne Hills is driving on the Demarus 25-yard line, looking to score again before the first half ends. So it's second and two here for the Wayne Hills Patriots at the Norseman 21-yard line. 4.57 here left in the first half. Boom and Barricat split left. Jimmy Papa hand off the Seco off the middle of the field as the Seco scampers for about seven or eight yards and that will be enough to move the chains. And as I was saying, the beginning of this drive, it was so important for the Norsemen to stop the Patriots and it's not the case. The Patriots keep shoving it down the Norsemen's throat and driving down the field and to the potential to put up points on the board. Yeah, it could definitely be a huge momentum shifter if Demaris can stop Wayne Hills on this drive. First and 10 from the Norseman 15 yard line. I formation, DeSico and Masu in the backfield. Jim Papa hand off to DeSico to the right side. As DeSico gets a short gain, then he is taken down by a group of Norsemen. So it'll be about second and long here for the Wayne Hills Patriots inside the red zone. And here come the receivers in for the Patriots. Krasinski and Barakat check in. Chisholm and uh, Brian Ogden check out. As you see Jeepu coming back onto the field. So the Patriots are trying to extend their 14 to nothing lead. If you're just joining us, I'm David Suntup alongside Andrew Guy and Jason Alfont. 3.45 here left in the first half. Dan DeSico accounts for both Wayne Hills touchdowns in the game. Barakat and Brzezinski split right. Jipu rolls out to his left. He's getting chased. As the pass goes off the hands of Scott Schultz. So it'll be third and eight for the Wayne Hills Patriots. And we saw the mobility by Mike G and Papa there. He scrambled out of the pocket, was getting rusty outside, and he dumped it off, you know, just tipped off Scott Schultz's hand. Yeah, good mobility there shown by Jipu. He moved to the left, threw it to Scott Schultz. Couldn't complete, complete the pass though. But don't be surprised here on this next play if Wayne Hills tries to use the very popular play in their playbook, the bubble screen. Last time Wayne Hills was on offense, they had a third and three. Basically inside the red zone on the Norseman 20 yard line and they had the Seco score on a 20 yard touchdown. So they could definitely convert rushing or passing as they empty the backfield. Pass is complete to number 20, Dan DeSico. And he's in for the touchdown. Dan DeSico's third touchdown of the game on a 13 yard reception. And the Wayne Hills Patriots take a 20 to nothing lead. Jason, excellent call there. It was the bubble screen that was called to Dan DeSico. And he is pumped up, man. Third touchdown of the game. And Jason, you did your homework. You knew that the bubble screen was coming. I knew it was a very effective play for Hills. Dan DeSico, strong and powerful, just leveled his shoulder in. Another touchdown yet again for the superb running back, Danny DeSico. As Scott Schultz is on for the extra point. 29 for 30 on the season. Snap is good, hold is good, and the kick is beautiful as it splits the uprights. 21 to nothing, Wayne Hills over Demers. Quoting me, David. Yeah, I am <laughs> quoting you. That's the first thing that came to mind, me watching the football highlight video when you made that call. With the extra point. Oh, no, that was the field goal, right? Yeah. Field goal. If you missed it earlier, Wayne Hills got called for a defensive penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct on a touchdown, and Scott Schultz had to kick a 35-yard extra point and nailed it. That just shows how great a leg Scott Schultz truly has. Well, Jason, it's not just the leg that he has, it's the accuracy that he's really worked on. Last year, in terms of kickoffs, 19 touchbacks. This year, only two, because he's worked on getting more air time under his kicks, so the coverage team will have more time to get down the field and stop the ball carrier. So 
basically, the return team would have a net loss of about five yards because they'd be starting at about the 15 yard line instead of the 20 yard line. And on the extra points, now 30 for 31 on the season. I believe last season, Scott Schultz was 48 for 66. It's 75%. That's still very good, but 30 for 31 is just off the charts. As Schultz is ready to kick off. Stupendous. As the rest blow the play dead. Full start on the Wayne Hills Patriots. So I believe the Patriots off the kick again, probably from about the 35 yard line. 322 left here in the first half. Wayne Hills defeating Denver's 21 to nothing. If you want your school news, then watch Patriot Pride. It airs monthly, and it's better than ever. Five yard penalty also, any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email the Wayne Hills TV Club at waynehillstv at aol.com. Once again, that is waynehillstv at aol.com. As the Patriots are now forced to kick from their 35-yard line. As the kick is fielded at about the Norseman 25-yard line. And is returned to about the 40-yard line Daniel by Lee number five, Daniel Lee. Decent field position to start off for the Norsemen now. So they, this is their opportunity. They're down 21 nothing with three, a little over three minutes left in the first half. This is their opportunity to score and get on the board so they can get some momentum started. If the Norsemen want any chance to win this game, they have to score here. Because if they don't score here, Wayne Hill still has enough time to get down the field and score points. And then Wayne Hill starts the second half of the ball. So Wayne Hills could still score 14 points before the next time the Norsemen get the ball if they don't score here. Weiss rolls out to the right side of the field and he's taken down with the 41-yard line Weiss by Dan DeSico. By so besides DeSico having a DeSico. great game on offense and special teams, he's also doing his job on defense. Back to what you le just last said, Dave. Demers does need to score on this drive because if they don't score, there's no way that they can no win in this game. The they need to compete with their... <laughs> and now we are joined by a special guest in the booth, Eddie Tuminella. How you guys doing? Well, we're, we're, we're pretty cold, Eddie. I mean, you know, 2.45 remaining in the half. Your thoughts on the game thus far right now? Wayne Hill's leading 21-0. It's, it's very surprising that the, that the game has been so close. They're getting... Demers is getting a lot of good pressure on G and Papa, you know. He doesn't have a lot of time to throw the ball. Oh, and a reverse here. A multiple reverse. The Patriots handle it pretty well, though. We got bumped around there. Back to our interview with Mr. Tuminello. Eddie, you're a baseball player. How, and you know, you, are you looking forward to this season at all coming up? Oh yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to this season a great deal. You know, Coach Inell, he's, he's a great guy. Really good coach, same with Coach Rella. <laughs> you know, I love them to death, shout out to them. Back to the game here, I mean, <laughs> the Patriot defense has been excellent the whole season. How has that factored into tonight's game and the way that they've been stopping Harrison Weiss and the Denver Stall offense? Well, you know, they're just swarming the ball. A lot of speed off the end by David Ogden and Kyle Hannenberg. They're looking really good so far. Thank you, Eddie, and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you very much, guys. Back to the action here. As you see Coach Olsen talking to his defense. 209 here left in the first half. Wayne Hills defeating Demers 21 to nothing. It'll be third and 11 from the Norseman 39 yard line. Big possession here for the Norseman. Because like I said before, Wayne Hills could have 14 points by the next time Demers gets the ball back. I see Andrew Pereja and Nico Stevens talking to John Goldstein on the sideline. Andrew Pereja had a great block on Dan DeSico's first touchdown on offense. First touchdown on offense. As Wayne Hills is set on defense, Weiss brings his troops to the line. Third and 11 from the Norseman 39 yard line. Two wide receivers split right. Shotgun formation. As there's a flag on the play as Kevin Barricat is boarding to the Norseman. 
Probably a false start on the Norseman. And this there is a false start on the Denver Norseman. It will now be third and 16 from their own 34 yard line. The center for the Norseman lifted their head up and that's a false start because you can't do that. He moved on the line, that's a false start. Five yard penalty for Demaris. That's probably the sixth penalty in this game for the Norseman. They had three or four penalties on their last drive, including one that knocked them back 30 yards. So now it's third and 16 from their 34 yard line. Like I said before, if you want to beat the Patriots, you can't play carelessly and you can't commit penalties because you're never going to win. Three wide receivers set. As Taylor Michael Moore is in motion. As Weiss is sent down in the backfield for a loss by Mike Roman. Great play there by the Mike Patriots Roman defense. Great coverage there by Wayne Hills. Called the play perfectly. Mike Roman on the tackle. And it was just excellent reading of the Patriots on that defensive stop there, which pushed them to fourth and 16. The Patriots right now are playing at an all-time high, whereas on defense, this game, they've really, they've kept the Patriots offense, I don't want to say in the game, but I mean, because in the early going, the Patriots were struggling, but their defense has really upsided their offense to pr progressing in this game to giving them a 21-0 lead. So after Demarest having a decent second drive on offense where they got the ball into Patriots territory, ever since those penalties that took them out of Patriots territory on the third drive, they haven't been able to get anything going on offense since. And now if 155 here left in the first half, they'll be forced to punt. And Wayno's offense is so powerful that even with a limited amount of time, they could still score. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised here on a return if the Seco or Carlton Marston would return it all the way for a touchdown. They're just superb on punt returns. I'm still surprised that Shane, excuse me, that Matt Giannetti has not tried to kick the ball out of bounds yet. <laughs> I wouldn't want to let Carlton Marston or Dan Seco try to return a punt. And we have a clock <laughs> malfunction. You know, they, they have intended to put two minutes and one second on, but they put 20 minutes and 10 seconds on. I mean... We must not be the guru of clocks. Yeah, we are definitely having problems here. Well, they've had here. problems the whole season managing the clock. Yeah, the clock management isn't good here. But at Wayne Hills, just 2010, it's more like one minute. Two minutes, 10 seconds. We had to make a call to the bullpen, Margaret, to get up here. As the clock is still not settled, but Matt Giannetti is ready to kick this one away. Snap is good. A deep kick by Giannetti as it pushes Carlton Marson back to about the 26 yard line. Good block by Danny DeSico. Marson up the sideline and he's taken out at about the 39 yard line. Carlton Marson made something out of nothing there. He re recovered it at the 28 yard line, was fading back and got a good 12 yard return. Good return there by Carlton. Great punt there by G Matt Giannetti. I mean, he got a lot of air under it and it made Carlton Marson go back. But as you said, Jason, he made a good pursuit after he caught the ball and ran up the, uh, to the outside to get some extra yardage. Stick around after the first half for the Wayne Hills marching band and then the in the locker room report with Carlton Marson. First and 10 from the Wayne Hills 40 yard line. Two minutes and one second here left in the first half. So now it's a two minute drill. And now we'll see what the Patriots offense is made of in terms of time management. The wide receiver split right. Jim Papa back to pass. He rolls out to his right, looking downfield, and he completes it to Dan DeSico as he scampers ahead for about Jim seven yards Papa in the play as a flag is thrown in the backfield. A lot of composure shown there by Jifu throwing a great five yard pass to Dan DeSico. Seco can do it all. He's a returner, he's a running back, and he's a receiver. sure what the penalty is here, David. It's holding on Wayne Hills. Not sure what holding number. A lot Patriots. of penalties this game for the Patriots. Uh, not really uncharacteristic of the Patriots. Definitely uncharacteristic of the Patriots. When you think of the Wayne Hills Patriots, you think of discipline. 
that's the first thing that comes to mind. This is a very disciplined football team. They don't turn over the ball much. They make smart decisions, and they don't get a lot of penalties. But it really hasn't cost the Patriots as much as it's cost the Norsemen. So that's a 15-yard penalty. Jim Papa back to pass, looking to the left side of the field. As Mike Fulham bobbles the pass and drops it. So that was a good pass by Jim Papa. Fulham just couldn't hold on. You won't see that too often from Mike Fulham. From Coverage there by number 22, Taylor Michael Moore. Fulham was wide open, just flat out dropped it. Like Dave said, very uncharacteristic there by Mike Fulham. And by any of the wide receivers for the Patriots. You don't see that often. But you know what? That plays over with, you gotta move on, and that's how the Patriots handle mistakes. So now the clock is still really not working correctly. I don't know what the down, I know it's second down, or at least according to the score, but I don't know how many yards they have to go. As Gian Papa tries to make something out of nothing, he eludes a defender, he rushes up the right side of the field, and he's taken that at about the 35 yard line. Actually, about the 34-yard line as Gene Papa runs to the sideline to get the play. Dave, do you think that Wayne Hills will play it safe, or do you think that they will attempt to score again with 126 remaining in the first half? Well, I would still try to get points on the board. As Demarest calls their third timeout of the first half, you still have a lot of time. 126 is a lot of time as you see Coach Olsen talking to his offense. Especially if you could complete passes towards the sideline and get out of bounds. 126 is still a lot of time. And as long as you don't make any bad throws, there's no reason why Wayne Hills can't add points to their total. I see Coach Olsen instructing his offense, talking to Dan DeSico. Maybe a bubble screen here. Probably not, though, but you never know. The Patriots have a lot of unique plays in their playbook. I know what I like to see. I like to see Jim Pop go deep down the field to Mike Fulham. I know Mike Fulham, and I know he wants to make up for that drop pass. Mike Fulham is a flat-out playmaker for this Wayne Hills team on offense and defense, and you know really bad that he wants the ball in his hands again on offense. What would you guys do here in the situation? You know what? I'd take a chance, David. You're right. You got second and 17 here. Jim Papa has a very good arm. I try to throw it deep. That's just me, though. I'm not Coach Olsen. I would like to pass it to one of their star wide receivers and Kevin Barrett had or Mike Fulham, Dave. Actually, it's second and 17 on their own 33-yard line. Shotgun formation, Jim Papa back to pass. He's going deep down the field intended for Kevin Barakat as Barakat is overthrown. So now it'll be third and 17 from the Patriots 33-yard line. And you know what, even though it was an overthrow, you saw that Mike Jim Papa has a little pop under that. He's got Kevin some. Michael, you, you're you really a complete player. Let me tell you, you have a lot of weapons on you. Jay so Papa definitely has the arm strength, but Kevin Barakat was double covered there. I probably would have gone for full in there since Barakat was in double the coverage. The Actually, Patriots now it's fourth down. This Mike scorebord is really messing up. It said second down. I mean, did I miss third man. down? Did no. I fall asleep during third down? I don't think so. Snap is high. A nice high kick by DeSico as it bounces out of bounds at about the 48 yard line. So Darius have a minute to go 52 yards for a score. So the Denver Norsemen have pretty much been given good field position in this game so far. And they really haven't been able to capitalize at all. Oh no, not at all, David. You're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's just been a struggle for the Demarest Norsemen this game on the offensive side of the ball. The problem for Demarest thus far this game has been penalties. Costly penalties have been killing them. I see Tony G and Papa and Mr. Mink waving to the camera. Oh, goodness. What great moments we share. We're talking to Mrs. G and Papa, Linda G and Papa, before the game, and she's just a huge fan of WHTV. More on that later. Weiss back to pass. Flag is thrown. Weiss scrambles to his right, being rushed by Dave Ogden and Kyle Hannenberg as the pass is incomplete, intended for number 12, Matt Robertson. The one-handed wonder. Weiss 
I do not know how talented Matt Robertson is, but it just shows you how much heart he has to play a game like football with one arm. It just shows you that if you have heart and desire, you can do anything that you want to do. You really can. You push to success, and you know what? If you see something you want, go and get it, because this young man has put a little hard... He's put some warmth in my heart, to say the Illegal least. I now have the confidence to do whatever I fit wish. Yeah, Dave, that is a great, inspiring story for Matt Robertson, getting to play with one arm. He just is a very inspiring young kid, and he has great talent as well that many people don't know about, and we will see it in today's game. 50 seconds here left in the first half. Wayne Hills leading the Denver Norseman 21 to nothing. Two wide receivers split right, eye formation. Weiss hands off to Esposito, and Esposito gets about one yard on the play. Demers is being really conservative here. Are you surprised Esposito that Demers is being conservative here? I would be, I mean, and I wouldn't Matt be conservative, Johnson but I think they're the being tackle. more safe yeah. than instead of throwing an interception or fumbling so that the Patriots get an opportunity to score because they don't have a lot of confidence in scoring for the Norsemen. Yeah, you made a key point there, Andrew. Wayne Hills gets the ball in the second half. As that pass is intended for number 27, Keith Dooley, and he is absolutely whacked by number five, Jeff Brzezinski. And as we talked about before, Jeff Brzezinski is the king of big hits. And Prue hit him hard there. I mean, he laid him out. He, he let him know that his presence was heard. By number five, Jeff Brzezinski. So now, according to the scoreboard, it's third and seven on the Norseman 47-yard line. You have to take one deep try down the field. That's my opinion. How do you guys feel? Absolutely. Weiss has the arm. Test it. Weiss, shotgun formation. No. They're Actually, punting. They're, they're punting. Oh, God. I bet you it was fourth down Jerry the scoreboard. To punt as the ball rolls at about the 19-yard line. You know what, David? It was the scoreboard malfunction. I don't think it was third down. I think it was fourth because they wouldn't punt it there yeah, on third down. I think that's not. what happened on the previous ones, too. We were just tricked by the, the scoreboard. The scoreboard is making the announcers look terrible. Foolish. That's all I could say. Foolish. I look like a fool up here. David, you never look like a fool. Like, you're, you're a man of wisdom. Five seconds here left wisdom. in the first half. As Way Hills will run one more play, and that will take us to halftime. As G Papa runs onto the field. Stay tuned for the Wayne Hills Marching Band and then the In the Locker Room Report with Carlton Marson. QB Neal, I'm calling it. <laughs> I think so, no reason to risk injury here. I was just kidding. <laughs> As Jeep who's going deep down the field, it is over the head intended for number six, Brian Ogden. I'm a little surprised there about the play call and trying to go deep down the field. I guess they're trying to catch Denver to sleep. So that's the end of the first half here at Patriots Stadium. The Wayne Hills Patriots are defeating the Denver Norseman 21 to nothing. Guys, what are your thoughts on the first half? Well, it was a, it was a first half that just was, it was really a, a struggle for the Denver Norseman. Wayne Hills came out early with a seven nothing lead and Denver looked like they had some Fire in the bellies there for a while, but Wayne Hills put things back to reality. They're up 21 nothing at halftime. Let's see how it carries over into the second half of action. Wayne Hills not having their high power offense as usual, even though the score still is 21 to nothing. That is a pretty decent score for the end of the first half. Carlton Marson and, and Dan DeSico, the two-headed monster, have been great yet again. Mike Fulham getting in on the action, has six tackles and has a couple of receptions. And also Scott Schultz has been having a great game so far, four receptions and a touchdown. Early on, Wayne Hills really didn't get much going on offense. Demers did a great job playing defense and defending against the run. But I really like the connection between Mike Giampapa, Scott Schultz, and Dan DeSico has all three touchdowns in this game. And now, here is the Wayne Hills marching band. As you see the Wayne Hills marching band coming onto the field. 
So guys, what are your keys for the second half? The second half keys for the Patriots is to control the tempo and control the control the clock. Excuse me. The, the, the right now on defense they've been dominating like they have been the whole year. They don't have much to worry about except that they the way they can lose this game is by themselves losing it for them. The Denver's is not going to come back if they continue their style of play. Yeah, Wayne Hills is clicking on all cylinders. And in order for Demarest to compete in the second half, they need to open up some wide receiver screens. They need to get Harrison Weiss throwing the ball more often. And look for Keith Esposito to get the running attack going. Demarest has not scored more than 13 points in any game this season. So it would really take a miracle for the Norsemen to come back in this contest. And especially with the type of defense that the Patriots play. With the first team defense not allowing a single point this season. It's really going to take a miracle for the Demarest Norsemen to come back in this game. It is miraculous how the Wayne Hills defense hasn't allowed a point on any drives for the first team defense. That defense consists of Dave Ogden, Andrew Pereja, Matt Johnson. Their defense just stifling and relentless pursuit all year by them. the Wayne Hills marching band led by director Matt Paterno. Any
thank you to the Wayne Hills Marching Band. And now, stay tuned for the In the Locker Room Report as I interview running back number 25, Carlton Marson. Enjoy, folks. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Wayne Hills Football Halftime Show. I'm David Stuntup, and today I'm standing by with running back number 25, Carlton Marson. So, Carlton, Wayne Hills, Don Bosco, Ray Van Pienens just rushing to the right side of the field. He's not getting up. He's hurt. What's going through your mind? And when you heard that he would be out, what did what what did you think you needed to do to step up? Well, I mean, when Ray was down, I mean, I mean the whole the whole I mean every I mean the same thing was running through everybody's head. I mean, um, it was like, is he gonna get up? Is he gonna be all right? Is he gonna be? Is he gonna come back? I mean, what happened? But um, I mean, when I heard he was out and I heard he was gonna be out for a while, I mean, everybody was just devastated. We di we di we didn't know if we could if we could still be the same team. But I mean, Coach Olson talked to us. I mean, he said he said with Ray out, I mean, we all need to step up. Everybody needs to step up and. Me and Danny, I mean, we're stepping up. I think we're doing a pretty good job with the running game and just keep it going through the season. Speaking of stepping up, how has the running attack been so successful this season? Well, I think the running game has has a lot to do with the offensive line. I mean, the offensive line has been doing an amazing job this year. I mean, the holes, I mean, you, you could drive a truck through the holes. They're so big. I mean, the offensive line has just been a key asset to this running game for me and Danny. And I mean, they're going to keep doing it through the season. Why do you think the holes in the line have been so big? The holes line been so big because I mean, just look at our guys. They're big. They're huge. I mean, Matt Matt Johnson, Dave Ogden, uh, Pre Andrew Preha, um, Scott Iowa Schultz, uh, Steve Steve. I mean, DiBianco. They're just they're huge. They're strong. They're they're big guys. And I mean, big guys pushing other big guys. I mean, our guys our guys are stronger. I mean, and I mean, I mean, and and you can definitely see it because I mean, Olson works us in the weight room hard, and I mean, it shows on the field. Besides being a key asset in the running attack, you've also been a key asset in special teams, two touchdowns on kickoff returns and punt returns. How have you been so successful on special teams? And talk about the job that special teams coach Wally Johnson has done. Well, I mean, Coach Johnson, he is an amazing um, special teams coach. I mean, every day we're out there, me and Danny, punt returning, uh, kick returning all the time. I mean, I have to catch punts. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, 30 minutes before practice, like in the beginning of practice, we do special teams, and then um, about uh, about 20 minutes after practice, me and Danny stay and catch punts from the jugs. I mean, he's just an amazing special teams coach, and he's been working me and Danny really hard, and it shows in the field. What's the key to your great punt returns? Do you think it's more blocking, or do you think it's more skill? What do you think is the key asset? Well, I mean, um, being a headhunter as Jeremiah Kale and. Uh, Kevin Bearcat are. I mean, it's probably the hardest job in the field because you got guys running full speed at you and you have to block them and, and help contain. I mean, Jeremiah Kale and uh, Kevin Bearcat have, have done a, a great job of keeping the headhunters uh, away from me, and uh, Danny Siegel has done a good job lead blocking. Who has been your biggest influence in football, and what is it like to be around NFL locker rooms and be on the field at NFL stadiums? Well, I mean, I mean, my, my biggest inspiration is definitely my grandpa. I mean, he's always on me about football and school. I mean, school, obviously, first, but he's always on me about school and football. He's always pushing me, asking me, uh, calling me every day, I mean, even if he's not home, asking me how how practice went. Um, you guys got anything new going on or how's the week been? How's school? I mean, he's always asking me. He's always on me about everything. And I mean, being around being around NFL guys, I mean, I mean, I, I, I guess just another privilege for me, because I mean, to to be around them and to watch how they do everything, and I mean, I I pick up tips while I'm there, so I mean, it's a it's a really good inspiration. What's the most important thing that your grandpa taught you about football? See, the most important thing he's taught me about football is no penalties, no fumbles. He said, if you have no penalties and no fumbles throughout your high school career, you'll be good. And he said that scouts and coach and college coaches look at that a lot. And I mean, I haven't had a fumble or a um, or a uh, penalty yet this year, so hope I keep that going. Carlton, thank you very much. Best luck against Demers on Friday. Now let's send it back to the booth for the second half of the Wayne Hills Demers football game. Thanks, guys. I'm standing here with Max Henson and Ricky Katz, sports editors of the Patriot Press. All right, guys, it seems week in and week out, all we talk about is the rushing game, Danny Seco, Carlton Marson in particular. But what other parts of this Wayne Hills team stand out offensive, defensively, whatever? Well, I think today you really got to give some credit to the D-line. They're really playing well, and they're getting a lot of pressure on Demarest's passing game. And in turn, it's making the secondary have an easier time in covering the receivers. No one's open out there, so you really got to give a lot of credit to the D-line. All right, Ricky? Well, the passing offense hasn't had their best day today, but Scott Iowa Schultz has made key catches in the middle. He's getting a lot of yards after the catch, setting up those rushing touchdowns, and I like the way that he's playing. 
All right, guys, that's all from down here right now. We'll be right back with the second half of play after a short break. Welcome back to the second half of action here at Patriots Stadium. The Wayne Hills Patriots are defeating the Demarest Norsemen 21 to nothing. I'm David Suntup, and now I am standing by with sports journalist for the Wayne today, Rich Stambulian. So Rich, Wayne Hills, and their first four games, they have just been unstoppable on offense. Tonight, in the early going, points are hard to come by, and Demarest forced the Patriots to punt twice early in the game. How is Demers able to stop this potent Wayne Hills offense? Well, Demers looks to be playing a pretty physical game. I think uh, a little more physical than some of the teams that uh, Hills has played prior to uh, this game. Um, and I think they're coming out with some intensity. You know, we have to remember that Demers has been a very strong team the last couple of years, actually defeated the Patriots a couple of years ago uh, in the regular season and, uh, you know, has given them all they can handle. So that I'm sure the Demers team is coming into this game with you know, some amount of confidence that they can that they can stay in the game and, and compete with the Wayne Hills team. Demarest, early in the game, they're able to move the ball down the field. What do you think of their play calling in certain situations, especially with the punt by Harrison Weiss on fourth down? And then I believe they did another punt in a very questionable spot on third down. What do you think of their play calling in some key spots? Well, when you're facing a defense that's as uh, strong as Wayne Hills, a, a team that's allowed an average of uh, like three points or something over three points in the first four games, you have to resort to some trickery sometimes. And um, if it means quick kicking on third down and try to get an extra, you know, maybe 20 yards when the team's not expecting a punt or mixing up your play calling a little bit to try and catch them off guard, that's what happens you know, when, you're, when you realize that you probably can't beat a team playing them straight up, you resort to some, you know, some gadget plays. Denver started off the season one and three, which includes losses to Bergenfield and Mawa. I know Mawa started off four and oh, but in the last couple of years, they've been a weak opponent. And Denver's also lost pretty badly to Northern Highlands. What has Denver done differently tonight to at least play respectable against Wayne Hill so far? Well, I think it's, uh, I think a lot of it goes back to, the, as I mentioned before, the, the little, bit, the somewhat success they've had in the last couple of years. You know, they played, they played um, Hills tough in a couple of years, the last couple of years. And also, every team that Wayne Hills plays this year has them circled on their calendar. So we, we can expect to see the best effort or, or the, the team come in at a high pitch knowing that they want to play their best so that they're not blown out and completely embarrassed. We've seen Demers move the ball down the field once, and we've seen flashes of defense, decent offensive production. Why hasn't Demers been able to score against other teams like Fairlawn and Bergenfield and Mawa? I think probably they lost their biggest weapon, uh, Mike Goulad, early in the year, and they just don't have anybody to replace him. I think it's really that simple because Harrison Weiss is a, is a uh, pretty skilled and, and uh, respectable quarterback. I think he just misses the the uh, talents of Mike Goulad, who's very similar to his uh, older brother. I know you remember Richie. Um, so without him, they're really, they just don't have it, the depth to fill in for him, like say we see with Wayne Hills, with uh, Danny DeSico filling in so well for uh, for uh, Ray Van Pena. Also, don't forget Carlton Marston. He's also done a absolutely, fantastic job. Absolutely, absolutely. Who do you think was a bigger loss for Demers? Kenny Amsel to graduation last year. He had a phenomenal year on both sides of the ball. Or Mike Goulad to the torn ACL. I would have to say uh, I would have to say Mike Goulad because he's a game breaker. Um, Amsel was a very tough runner, but I think uh, Mike Goulad was blessed with more speed, and he could beat you running the ball as well as as well as catching the ball. So I would have to say he's their bigger, biggest loss. And also, when you lose a, a kid to graduation, you can plan for that. Um, losing a kid at the beginning of the season with a torn ACL is a really tough blow, and there's no way to plan for, for a loss like that. Rich Stambouin, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Always a pleasure. That was Rich Stambouin, a sports journalist for the win today. Now, back to the booth for the second half of action. I'm David Suntop alongside Andrew Guile and Spencer Furtick. So guys, looking ahead to the second half, Wayne Hills is up 21 to nothing. What do they have to do on this offensive possession to add more points to the board? Well, they're gonna have to take off a lot of time off the clock in order to melt down and get their game plan going early. And I think they have to establish the running game. The running game has been pretty solid tonight, shaky at times against this big Demarest front, but I think if they get the running game going, they'll be in good shape. 
I agree with Andrew. I think that away in Hills Keystone has been the running game, and they need to find that again. As Matt Giannetti kicks off, the kick is fielded by Dan DeSico as he takes it to the left side of the field. He's at the 20, and he is knocked out of bounds at about the 25-yard line. DeSico on the kickoff return, run of, out of bounds by number four, Keith Esposito. Temperature's really gone down, David, since the f end of the first half, it seems. It's gotten very cold. Well, Andrew, I'm not going to lie, but I was colder before the game than I am now. Now I feel pretty warm. First and ten my preparation for the game in terms of clothes was really smart on my part. My parents really tutored me well on what to wear for this game. I I'm feeling good right now. The cold weather is not really affecting me. I have no toes, so I'm pretty jealous of you at this point. I literally cannot feel well, my I wore toes. my ski socks. Well, I don't ski, so I don't have ski socks, so, you know, you're at an advantage. As Jeepu gives a signal to Danny DeSico, as Seco cuts it to the left side for a gain of about three yards. One thing you have to admire about this Denver's team is despite the score on the scoreboard being 21 points in the other team's favor, the intensity they're playing with is different than any other team that's come to the stadium this year, and it's at least making the game a little more exciting for us to call. I agree with you, Spencer, because Wayne Hills against other opponents, they would just run over the other team. Every rush would be about seven or eight yards at least. Demers has done a decent job shutting down the Wayne Hills rushing attack, and Wayne Hills has really had to work for all the yards that they've gotten on the ground. Giampapa, play action. As he throws it away, Pass intended for Dan DeSico. Nico Stevens and Dave Ogden were blocking downfield, but they are not eligible receivers, so Gene Papa could not throw to them. So he just threw out of bounds. And if they had to say who the pass was intended for, it would be intended for Dan DeSico, just so it's not intentional grounding. So now it'll be third and eight on their own 26 yard line. I think they're going to have a halfback draw here, David. I just have a gut feeling. Actually, they're not because there's no halfback in the back Five field, wide now. receiver set. Seiko and Foam split left. Try a quarterback keeper there. A GM Papa takes it for GM Papa on about a four or five yard gain. Daniel Lee and Chris Coltrar on the tackle. So now it'll be fourth. Will and about Patriots. four for the Patriots. The Seco back to punt. A nice high deep kick by Dan to Seco. As it's touched by a Devers player, recovered by Kevin Barricat. And Barrett returns it for a touchdown. What a careless play on special team by number 27 Keith Dooley as the Wayne Hills pitcher take advantage and take it in for a touchdown. But there is a flag on the play. Let's see what the call is. And it appears it's going to be against Wayne Hills. A great play, though, there by Kevin Barrett. Very heads up on his part. And the one thing is, while Wayne Hills has not played their personal team best game, they really have been able to capitalize on quite a bit of mistakes by the Denver's team, as shown in this play by Kevin Barricat and earlier in the game when Danny DeSico ran back for a touchdown, an awful punt by kicker Giannetti. And it is a touchdown. The is declined as the ref signals touchdown. So, I believe that is Kevin Barricat's first touchdown of the season. Nope, it's the second. He had the 75-yard oh yeah, the, the, the interception. Return. See, that's why I'm looking at my stats. Didn't tell you too much of that. Well, now I'm looking at my stats. I, I, I made that table before I looked at my stats. That's why I have the stats. It counts as a choke. His first yeah, touchdown on special hand. teams. Yeah, it it still as a choke. You choke. I believe he had a touchdown. On defense. Against against Fairlong. Oh, yeah, yes. As the extra point is good. The as Scott good. Schultz is 4 for 4 in extra points in the game. And now 31 for 32 on the season. That's just a phenomenal percentage. And you know, David, in that same dictionary that you used to look up the word resilient and find the picture of the Danny DeSico, I can look up the word reliability and now find the picture of Scott Schultz. I mean, 31 to 32, an extra point after the touchdown, that is the definition of reliability. And he really has provided a lot of stability for the team this season. Last season, in the state title game against Parsippany Hills, Scott Schultz, 
I believe when I'm not Julie totally sure on the statistics here. I think it was something like maybe like two for five or two for six on extra points. I think kicking in Giant Stadium may have rattled him because the goal posts are narrower, so there's less room to kick the ball through. But ever since that game, maybe it was a blessing in disguise after all because look how well he's kicked this season. It was something that told him, Scott, you have the potential to be a very good kicker. As the kick is fielded by Dooley, who fumbled on the previous punt return. As Dooley takes it out to about the 22 yard line and Harrison Weiss and the Denver North will take over from there. And Ed if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email the Wayne Hills TV Club at Wayne Hills TV at Yahoo.com. Once again, that is Wayne Hills TV at Yahoo.com. As Weiss hands up the middle to Esposito, as Esposito gets a gain of about one or two yards on the play. So now Wayne is up 28 to nothing. And by the way, Demarest has played this season, not scoring more than 13 points in any game. Demarest basically has a very low morale right now, and they basically have no chance of coming back. As it's another handoff, I believe the handoff was to Keith Esposito. I'm not totally sure. Esposito again on the carry. If I'm a Demarest Norseman, I'm pretty discouraged at this point because the intensity with which the Norsemen came into this game was very high, and I know they had the intention of Mike making a Roman statement against this Scott Patriots team. And unfortunately, tackle. even their best efforts have really not come, up, come to any fr fruition with regard to results on the scoreboard. So this has to be frustrating for the Norsemen. Well, I guess for Demarest, I know usually moral victories do not exist. I know that, but they've played a pretty solid game here in terms of defensive production. They've done a, a good job limiting Wayne Hills. They've only given up two touchdowns on defense, and they can take that into Pascock Valley next week when they play Pascock Valley at home as another handoff to Esposito. Now it'll be about fourth and five for Demarest, and they will send out the punt team. But Pascock Valley is the second best team in the NBIL. And Denver is going to need confidence against Pascock Valley. And Pascock Valley also has a very stingy defense. They really did a great job shutting down Ramapo. So it's going to be another tough week next week for Denver. As Matt Giannetti is set to punt for the Denver Norseman. Good snap. Nice high kick by Giannetti. That's about the 43 yard line where it's fielded by Dan DeSico. DeSico tries to turn the corner at the left. He's at the 50, the 45 40. He's down the left sideline to the five. Touchdown, Patriots. And Dan DeSico on a 60 yard punt return. And the Wayne Hills Patriots take a 34 to nothing lead. DeSico's fourth touchdown of the game. And DeSico is, he's unbelievable. Let's just face the facts. I mean, you saw his vision on that last play. He cut across the field and ran to the complete other side to go down the sideline, picked up a great block by Matt Johnson, and he was sprung from there. Great job there by Daniel DeSeagle, the junior running back. Four touchdowns today. Excellent job. There was also a beautiful block, if I'm not mistaken, by Scott Schultz, who's now cooking right now, and that shouldn't be lost in the mix. That was a beautiful block. Also, Carlton Morrison and Kevin Barakat, great job stalk blocking. As the extra point splits the uprights and the Patriots take a 35 to nothing lead. As the Patriots have not given up any points since week two against the Fairlawn Cutters. And that was a second team defense. So the first team defense is still not allowed any points this season. So in this game, Demers has only given up two touchdowns on defense. And they've given up three touchdowns on special teams. So the defense has played pretty solid tonight, especially against a, a team of Wayne Hill's caliber. 
but there are special teams, especially with their coverage, just really let them down. And unfortunately, Dave, uh, tomorrow in the papers, it won't have an asterisk next to this winner loss saying that the defense played pretty well. Unfortunately, as it looks right now, it's just going to go down as a loss for the Denver Norsemen. And that could be frustrating to the defensive unit, who have really done a good job and tried their hardest tonight. And before the second half started, I received an update from Ernie Mezzi. And the update was that the Passaic Valley Hornets were defeating the Wayne Valley Indians 13 to nothing at Passaic Valley. As Passaic Valley, I believe they played West Milford last no, week. No, West Orange. West Orange, excuse me. I got the West confused. Man. It was a nice kick by Scott Schultz. It's fielded by number 27, Keith Dooley. Dooley cuts it to the left side of the field as he is hit hard about the 20 yard line. So Passaic Valley is coming off a tough loss against West R. A very good team. Really hurt them in the power rankings. And Passaic Valley is bouncing back pretty well against the Indians. As the Indians were number one in the power rankings, about six points ahead of Wayne Hills. But at this time of the year, you don't really worry about power rankings. It's more about wins and losses because the power rankings will even out later in the year. So if Wayne Valley loses tonight, Wayne Hills would take over the number one spot in the power rankings. I mean, if both these teams are one and two, Wayne Hills and Wayne Valley, the only time they could play would be at Giants Stadium. And being one or being two would affect what jersey each team wears at Giants Stadium. As Harrison Weiss's pass is incomplete, intended for, I believe, number 22. Even the PA announcer doesn't know. But I think it was intended for number 22, pass Taylor. Colstar, the pass was intended for Chris Colstar. So Harrison Weiss has looked at him a lot, but Mr. Weiss has really not been able to get anything going in the passing game. No, he hasn't. He's not been able to get into a rhythm to in this game, this season, really, because the loss of Michael Lodd really has killed him. As Wayne Hills hockey player Jonathan Haas has just made his appearance here at Patriot Stadium. Weiss passes it out to Esposito. As Esposito gets to about the 28-yard line as a flag comes out of the backfield. Mike Masood on the tackle. As the Patriots There's still have their first team offense on the field. Down. Holding against Demarest. As that play is going to come back, holding against the Demarest Norseman. So another penalty for the Demarest Norseman. When things go bad, they go really bad. I guess you could say that. I guess you could say that is correct, David, because when things really, they were down 21 at the half, and you would think that they would try to get back into the game. Well, they did try, but things just, they got worse and worse as time went on. I mean, the, from the botched punt, to the recovered fumble, to the touchdown, to that punt return touchdown, things have just gone totally out of sync for the Norsemen. And I'm perplexed as to what type of play Denver should even run anymore because the running game outside of one or two good runs by Esposito has been fairly non-existent. And the passing game carries an air of desperation as Weiss just seems to try to be forcing it to targets that aren't open or aren't capable of receiving the ball. Well, that's because there's no weak link in this Wayne O's defense. It's just so solid as Esposito runs up the field and he's tackled at about the 27-yard line. But going back to what I was saying, you can't find a weakness in this Wayne Hills defense. The defensive line does a great job putting pressure on the quarterback. They do a great job stopping the run. So once the quarterback has pressure on him, he has to get rid of the ball quickly. But the linebackers and the secondary both do a fantastic job in coverage, so there's no one to throw to. So besides having no time to throw at anyone, there's no one to throw to. You're going to get sacked. Another key about this Wayne Hills team that's often overlooked is that they're filled with a bunch of smart players. Jeff Brzezinski, I believe, was on that tackle before, and I have a lot of time to speak with him, and he really knows schemes and plays inside out, and just the knowledge that they bring to it between overlooking plays uh, allows them to really know what plays a lot of times the offense is running and allows this defense to really be on key. Third and five for the Norsemen. Three wide receivers set. Weiss in shotgun formation. Weiss. Goes to the left side of the field. It is intercepted by number 44. Oh, they're saying it's incomplete. But from here, it looked like it was picked off by number 44, Mike Roman. And he read that play very well, David. Right after Weiss threw it, he was getting ready to lay out for it. And I thought he had it. We don't have the technical um, 
ability. We don't have the replayability. No, we don't have the replayability. So and there's no challenges in high school football. No, there is not. But if we had a good view, I would probably go with the refs and say that he dropped it. But from here, it looked like he picked it off. Matt Giannetti out to punt. He's had a busy day tonight. Let's see going Marson back to receive the punt. As they're still kicking in bounds. This side they kick the Carlton Marson as he retrieves the punt about the 35 yard line. Good deep by Marson. Oh, another great deep by Marson. He's at the 40, the 35. He's got daylight at the five. Touchdown Patriots. Carlton Marson with a 65 yard punt return as the Patriots get their third touchdown of the night on punt returns. They have just been sensational on special teams. We spent so much time speaking about the offense and defense of Demarest, and unfortunately, uh, this shows you what can happen when your special teams just does not show up to play on a given night. Things can go really awfully from there, especially when you have such a good special teams unit by the Patriots. Your special teams unit on, uh, for Demarest would need to be up to par, and it just hasn't been tonight. Oh, the coverage on Demarest. Part coverage team has just been terrible. And besides that, they can't tackle. Carlton Marston broke two tackles on that play as Scott Schultz misses oh. the extra point. It was almost blocked. Second miss of the season. So, and it's just so only the Patriots miss. are now 41 to nothing with 5.36 here left in the third quarter. So the Patriots have four touchdowns on special teams tonight. They've just been sensational. And special teams coach Wally Johnson <laughs> Must be ecstatic, that's all I can say. I don't see a blue moon out, so it's pretty shocking to me that Scott Iowa Schultz just missed that extra point. That kind of stuff only happens once in a blue moon. If I were Wally Johnson right now, boy do I wish I was him. I would not have Scott kick the rest of the point, extra points for the rest of the night. Just not to risk him missing anymore. The game's out of reach. I'd put in the reserves right now every, in every position. Well, I think they definitely are right now. They're already up 41 to nothing. They don't really have much more to prove. But what really puzzles me is Wayne Hills already returned two punts for touchdowns, both by Danny DeSico. Why does Scott Rubine continue to punt inbounds? Why? I just don't get it. I don't understand it either, David. As Tim Waller puts a great hit on a blocker. As he receives praise from the coordinators. As Keith Dooley is knocked out of bounds at about the 33 yard line. Andrew, I wonder if one day I became a high school football coach. How do you think I would fare? If you were a high school football coach, anywhere, any school? Any school. Any school. Well, you certainly wouldn't be an intimidating coach. I'll give you that much. You'd I'd be more of a player's coach. You'd be a, uh, uh, you'd be a player's coach that uh, you wouldn't want to get it by those big linemen. Let's put it that way. David, you're very, you're, you're petite, to say the least. I mean, I, but as far as coaching, you're, you, you've got some smarts. You know what you're talking about. You're not much a guru as I am, but you, nah. you could, you could fare but well. But why would you putt in bounds when two putts have ever returned for a touchdown? Well, I, I just don't get it. It boggles the mind. It does as flags are thrown all over the field. Both yeah. start on Demarest. Back in my days as a flag football star Four playing in Whitestone, New York Denver. on my nine-year-olds and up team, we used to be a big fan of using the Statue of Liber Liberty <laughs> trick play. And as I watch these high school games, I constantly find myself asking, where did it go? Uh, well, it's a lost art, Spencer, to say the least. I mean, as you were talking about your flag football days, my flag football days, I never had any. I wish I did, but you know what? If I were a coach back then, I would have instituted the Statue of Liberty play. High school football, though? Why is it not used more often? I don't know. I can't answer that question for you, but it should be. Well, the only two-hand football games that I had were at Turcuna on Metro School back in the day, but also with the tennis team back on a Sunday in June, I played football, and let's just put it this way. I was not exactly a guru, especially at quarterback. Max Henson played wide receiver, and he just torched me. He beat me down the field. His speed was just too much for me. And Daniel Katz and Max Henson really have a great bond with each other. Daniel Katz really threw the deep route to Max Henson, and then Max Henson just taunted me like crazy. And then also, I was trying to do my Jeremy Shockey impression as tight end. I was ready to catch a pass over the middle of the field. And Max Henson just, he just picks me off. He just steals the ball. He's like, thank you. And then he's dancing Deion Sanders into the end zone oh for a touchdown. 
I was just shell shocked. I wish I was there. His and feet blaze fire on the ground. Yeah, he, he's yeah. quick. And Ricky Katz is also great at managing the game at quarterback. Back to the action, second and 13 from the 30 yard line. Weiss back to pass, he rolls out to his right. Pressured by Schultz, as Weiss runs out of bounds at about the 20, 28 yard line for a nice loss of two on the play. Does that count as a sack? No. Because he forced him out of bounds, right? Yeah, it does not count as a sack. But before, the, before this game, Scott Schultz was the leader in sacks with five. I think Dave Ogden, the reason why his stacks are down this year, he's drawing a lot more double and triple teams. I mean, they put a lot of big bodies on Dave Ogden to stop, slow him down, I think. But the problem with that is everyone on that line is really talented. Obviously, Dave Ogden gets all the respect in the world, and he should because he had 18 sacks last year. But Scott Schultz, Matt Johnson, Kyle Hanneberg, they're really capable of really doing damage to quarterbacks and running backs. So you have to watch out for everyone on that line. Weiss fakes the pass, and he hands it off to Esposito, and he is absolutely slammed in the backfield by number 75, Nico Stevens, and number 35, Scott Schultz. Tim Waller, too, on the tackle. Actually, that, that was number 23, A.J. Below, the fullback. Watching this Demarest offense reminds me of my camping trips when we would be stuck in the woods and had no matches or light or fluid, and we would be just be stuck rubbing two sticks together, and you rub and you rub, but there's just no substance. And that's what it feels like is what's happening with this Demarest offense right now. They're trying and they're trying, but they've got absolutely nothing to prove for their efforts. Spencer, the analogy is just stupendous. That's all I can say. Well, Andrew, going back to week three against Northern Highlands, I said that if Demarest lost to Bergenfield, that they should hand back their helmets. Well, they didn't hand back their helmets no, yet. No, they didn't. As that punt is almost blocked by number 10, Kyle Hannenberg. And it almost hit us. <laughs> as it's out of bounds, not a good kick there by Matt Giannetti, as Wayne Hill's off prime time field position to start off this drive. That, that was dangerous, David. That could have hit a cheerleader. I mean, speaking of cheerleaders, Christina Bavona has there's a little thing called heart, and she has that. I mean, she goes out there. I was talking to her in history today. I'm like, you better watch out. It could rain tonight. She's like, you got to think positive. It's not going to rain. You know, cold weather or not, I'm going to go out there, you know, and do my best. And she has a lot of heart, you know. She's She's got swagger, too. I'll tell you that much. On the dark football night, Christina Bavona is often referred to as that one ray of sunshine that lights up the proverbial field. Absolutely, Spencer. Well put. Hail to Marson up the gut right, so as Carlton Marson gets a gain of about five yards. Any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email the Wayne Hills Video Club at waynehillstv at yahoo.com. Once again, that is waynehillstv at yahoo.com. As that was only a gain of about three on the play. So now it'll be about second and seven from the Norseman 27 yard line. I formation, Jipu passes it out to Chisholm as Chisholm is taken down about the 26 yard line. As Brian Ogden enters the game, the sophomore wide out, and Anthony Chisholm exits as Jipu gets the play from Coach Olson. Anthony Chrisall. So, guys. I really wish the New York Giants were watching this game because in the Giants' first three games, they've been absolutely pitiful on defense. <sighs> Don't even start, David. Aggravates me. Toss to Marson. He jukes to his left, and he's taken down Toss around the 17-yard line, and he moves the chains for the Wayne Hills Patriots. So a good run there by Carlton Marson. We already saw his explosiveness in that punt return, and now he's showing more of his ex explosiveness. And really talk about rising to the occasion. I mean, I know the storyline has been mentioned so many times, but the way both Carlton Marsden and Danny DeSigo have filled in Ray Van Peden's spot is truly seamless and remarkable. As another hand off to Carlton Marsden up the gut, and he takes it to about the four-yard line. 
So a 12 yard run for Carlton Marson. 142 here left in the third quarter. Wayne knows a 41 to nothing. So you, you can't say enough about these two young running backs, Carlton Marson and Danny Seco, how they've filled in. It's just flawless. The, the, the way they've gone and carried themselves on and off the field in the situation, very humble about it, and they've gone on and they let their on-the-field performance do the talk. First and goal on the five. Hand off Marson as he is hit hard by a host Marson of Norsemen. So that'll be second and goal around the five-yard line. If you're a pro sports fan, tune in to Carmelo Guarneri's radio show, 90.3 WRPR. The show runs every Saturday from 12 to 2 on 90.3 WRPR. Me and David called up. Yes, I did. We both and I did. talked about how the Mets were going to win the World Series. And I talked and then about Andrew refuted my points, but everyone knows that I was correct. Uh -huh. Cheers him in motion. Jim Papa, hand off to Marson. As I believe he's tackled inches short of the goal line. Dave, if you'll give me a second, I'd like to do one of those Marson small world kind of analogies. For those of you frequent uh, Wayne Hills television viewers, you might remember the classic baseball game called by Carmel Guaneri, Matt DeBow, and myself, Demarest versus Wayne Hills, where who do you think was the starting pitcher, Dave? For great yeah. guess, and you would be correct. Galad struggled that day, and I think his prowess is more on the football field than in baseball. Well, they left him in too very long, and he gave up, what, 12 runs or something uh, like I that? I would say so. <laughs> it was all about his mental reserves, though. Jumbo set here for the Wayne Hills Patriots. End of the quarter. As that's the end of the third quarter here at Patriots Stadium, the Wayne Hills Patriots are defeating the Denver Norsemen 41 to nothing. And now Jason Alfont will rejoin us in the booth. The Spencer, the thank you very much. Quarter. Thank you, Dave. This was real. And Andrew, this was oh. really a pleasure, and I hope oh, we can do you. it again. I hope you come back. You're a good man. As the teams will switch sides of the field, and Jason Alfont will take over the play-by-play -play duties. And now we're going to send it down to Matt Dubow, who has a special interview with Ray Van Peden. Matt, take it away. Thanks, guys. I'm standing here with Ray Van Peden, All-State tailback who's been out this far for a senior year. Ray, how's your rehab going and what's it really entailing? Uh, rehab's going great. I've been going for about five days a week for three hours, just working on agility, strengthening my knee, and it's coming out great, and I'll be back next week ready to play. So next week you're going to be back. It's official date? Next week is definite. All right, now, what's the most frustrating part about sitting on the sideline during your senior year when everyone had such high expectations for you? The most frustrating part, I'd say, is I've never been hurt throughout the 12 years I've been playing football, and now I come to my senior year, and I do get, I do have an injury, and now I'm sitting on the sideline. It sucks, but in other words, I could still be a leader out here on the sideline, coaching the kids, telling them what to do and what not to do on the field, and helping Danny and Carlton out, telling them where to run, where the holes are going to be, and they're doing a great job. That's very true. Good luck. The rest of your season, we'll be looking forward to seeing you back. That's all for down here. Back up to the booth. Thank you, Matt. Third and goal for the Wayne Hills Patriots on the Demarest one-yard line. Giapapa eye set formation. Carlton in the backfield. Hand off Carlton. Touchdown, Patriots. Carlton Marson's third touchdown of the game, and the Wayne Hills Patriots have extended their lead to 47-0 over the Demarest Norseman. Easy touchdown run there for Carlton Marson. Patriots are right on the one-yard line. They got close on the previous play, and Marson strolls into the end zone for the touchdown. As Andrew Guile is eating <laughs> a piece of a pretzel. Is there free As pretzels? Mike Q is getting a free pretzel. Uh, yeah, he found a dollar on the ground, too. Of that, Mike. Oh, I'm indulging. Scott Schultz's extra point is through the uprights and good. And the Wayne Hills lead is 48 to nothing with 11.56 remaining here in the fourth quarter. Guys, much what we expected here. Wayne Hills in the first half weren't as dominant as they usually were. But now in the second half, they have just turned the motors on and are doing great. Carlton Morrison, Danny DeSico, Mike Fulham, Scott Schultz. It's been an overall great game by the Wayne Hills team tonight. Oh, it has been. It's been a night of events. Mike McHugh, the lucky man, found a dollar bill on the ground. You know what that means, Dave, right? What does that mean? 
He's a lucky man. Yeah, he is a lucky man. You know, he just made a dollar. He's a great man. A good, very good man. Don and Mike taught him well. Some compare his curve, his curveball to Cole Hamels of the Philadelphia Phillies, Matt Green's favorite baseball team. <laughs> Are you a pro sports fan? Then watch the 30-minute drill with Jason Offutt, Jake Silverman, Aaron Plaschnik, Carlton Marston, Michael Botwinick, Sean Yu, and Dan Cohen. Weekly shows air, and it's just a fantastic show. Schultz to kick from his own 40. Dooley and Esposito to return. Kick, kick is a line drive booming kick to Dooley, and he will kneel it down in the end zone for a touchback. So now the Norse will take over on their own 20 yard line. And right now, if the starters are still in, you have to try to get some continuity on offense and look towards next week. Now David, I have a very important question for you, dating back to my question that, I asked, that you asked me. If I were a high school football coach, how would I fare? Well, Andrew, if we base it on your Madden play, you would be one of the worst coaches of all time. That's Madden. Yeah, that, that's Madden. You just can't play against someone of my caliber. And we have an update for you from Michael McHugh. In Detroit, Michigan, the Detroit Tigers are leading the New York Yankees three to nothing in the bottom of the third inning. Harrison Weiss's pass complete to Esposito. Tackled by number 69, Bowen Jones, at their own 19 yard line. So Bowen Jones comes into the game and he's making a statement as he tackles Esposito for a one yard loss. But back to that Yankee score, Randy Johnson has not pitched in a while and he's been rusty and he may be blowing up right now. Okay, David, we don't need you to analyze. We don't, well, we really Andrew, don't. I, I, I'm no. staying the truth. Dave, this we don't. was a game of two starters. Dave, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Michael McHugh is not very happy. <laughs> Kenny Rogers has had a terrible second half. So the Yankees are definitely not out of this game. Brandon Johnson could be good one game and bad the next game. So you never know what you could get out of him. Mike McHugh. Harrison Weiss, three-step drop, moving to his right, and he is sacked. Nico Stevens. Nico Stevens with the sack. Nico Stevens. By Nico Stevens. <laughs> He's a big boy, Nico Stevens. Oh, Nico Stevens is the biggest kid on this Wayne Hills team. All I can say is that if I was a quarterback, I would not want to be hit by Nico Stevens. But back to baseball here. I've really been proud of my New York Mets. They're up two to nothing against the Los Angeles Dodgers. And tomorrow night, they go for the clincher against the Los Angeles Dodgers. <laughs> Mike, Mike McHugh. Mike I'm McHugh lost is a words. rowdy fan here tonight. Third and 20 for Demarest the from their own 11. Face. Two wide receivers left, one right. And Weiss will punt it. It was fourth down. The scoreboard's messed up. And number 24 for the Norrisman. Number 34 for the Norrisman will bring it down for Demarest as Wayne Hills will take the ball back from their own 45 yard line. Dave, I know you're big on faithfuls. Yeah. What is your opinion on the Ghost Knights faithful? Well, it's a work in progress, that's all I can say. What so are far, what the faithful consists of me, David Suntup, and Stephanie Stowes. So, we really have to work on getting more members. If you're interested, just contact Andrew Guile. And David, what's the slogan for the Ghost Knights? You heard? <laughs> Seafried handoff to the Seco, but there's a flag on the play. As Mr. Messi mentioned before, Steve Seafried is now in the game for Mike Giapapa. Mark Kirk, a star of the flag football class in gym. I mean, he's he had a 25-yard touchdown run yesterday that really blew the game open. You know, this Tejas missed the tackle. I don't have his last name applicable. I mean, Mike Mike Brothers choked though. Phil Taylor threw a wide open pass to Mike Brothers in the end zone, and Mike Brothers dropped it flat on the ground. It was co a complete choke artist. And I mean, for, as I can quote Mr. Ionello, the gym teacher. Come on, brothers, you gotta get that one. I mean, it was it was a scene. Coach Idell, a man <laughs> of high expectations. Steve Freed tossed <laughs> again. 
Tamar Kirk. No gain of yardage. Kirk on the carry. Wayne Hill just trying to run down the clock here. No need to show off the, the Demers Norseman. But after this game, Demers is going to be one and four. And it's going to be really hard for them to make the North one group two playoffs. As this is the Norseman first year in group two. Yes, it is. They Last might be year. back in group three. Rumor ha in the paper I read yeah, about it. Yeah, next year. Yeah. Second and 10 from their own 33, Seafried, handoff. No, it's a play action and he's gonna run it himself. Slips a defender and he's down at his own, the Wayne Hills 38, gain of three on the play. He had me fooled on that one. I thought he was handing it off to Kirk, but he took it himself. Nice play there by Steve Seafried. And the action Steve Seafried has seen this year, he's actually been very effective passing. He's had almost all of his completions made. I think he's only had like two or three incompletions on the season, and he's been very efficient. And he's actually shown some mobility back there. Steve Seafried, in the opportunities he's seen playing, he's done very well. In the Northern Highlands game, Steve Seafried had a couple of nice runs. So we all know that he could definitely run the ball. Third and 20 for the Patriots from their own 39. Seafried, play action, rolling to his right. He's looking for Mike Fulham, and it's batted down incomplete. Actually, that was Kyle Herrick, number 10. No, it's oh. tough to see the numbers up here. The pass is blocked by Mike, Jesse Guzman. It's not funny. It's not funny. Stop. Did he go in to punt for the Patriots? Fourth and 20 for the Patriots. Dooley and Esposito are returned from their own 40. The Seco to kick from the Wayne Hills 20-yard line. So, Jason, looking ahead to the Giants versus the Redskins this Sunday at Giants Stadium, what's your prediction? Well, I want the Giants to win, honestly, because I'm a huge Giants fan, as we see DeSico punt it right now to Dooley as he waits for a fair catch. But the Giants, Eli Man has got to show up early, you know? He shows up too late in the fourth quarter. That can't happen. He has to be there for the first, second, third, and fourth quarters. And as usual, Tiki Barber needs to have that good running game intact. And also the wide receivers and Jeremy Shockey, Imani Toomer, and the head case, Plaxico Burris. Well, Jason, while I agree, Eli Manning has to be a little bit more consistent. It's more about the offensive line protecting Eli Manning. And they did a bad job the last two games. And then also, Tiki Barber really hasn't had the holes. But the biggest problem for the Giants has been their defense, especially their secondary. Their secondary has just been absolutely pitiful. Yeah, that secondary is terrible with Sam Madison. He's getting older as we go. Weiss eye set formation. Hands off to number 21. Melvin Diaz. Tyler Dito is actually in now for Demarest at quarterback. And we're going to have one last quick interview with Michael McHugh before he leaves. Michael, 48 nothing. your prediction was a little bit off. I'm a little upset about that, but um, what are your thoughts on the second half? My thoughts, Demarest, they were not the same team as they were in the first half. Their defense just, you know, it was not that good. It was, it was awful, to be honest with you. David has a question for you. Well, Michael, right now, your beloved New York Yankees, your favorite team. Dave, you want to start about the Yankees? <laughs> they're losing 3-0. They, they're a comeback team. Well, they, 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 how would you feel if they lost in the first round again? They will not lose in the first round, Dave. I'll tell you I that I still much. guarantee that they'll win the World Series. Kenny Rogers will choke. I'll, I guarantee it. Now, well, now quickly, let's see how much of a guru you really are, Michael. Now, Michael, before you leave, any comments about traveling basketball for high school sports? Ghost Knights, you heard? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for that stellar interview. Back to the action here, Jason. Players that are in now for Demarest. Sophomore Melvin Diaz. Actually, he's a senior Melvin Diaz, 5'11", 165 pounds. And a quarterback, Tyler Dito, he is the sophomore that is in, 6'155". As Dito hands off to Melvin Diaz, gain of no yards. I'm still surprised that most of the Wayne Hills first defensive unit is still Melvin out there. Do you think the it's on the more of 
wanting to give these guys more playing time so they have more continuity? Or do you think most of these guys are out there just so they have more endurance and stamina for later in the season? I think they're out there for more endurance because usually in this part of the game you would see most of the sophomores and juniors in getting their chance as it's 48 to nothing with six minutes in counting remaining. But I'm shocked as you are, Dave, that the seniors, including Dave Ogden, are still in the game on the defensive line. Well, the line is in there. The whole starting line is in there. But they do have some subs in there. Anthony Chisholm is in there. Eddie Rolf is in there. Number 23, A.J. Valone in motion, handoff, and it's fumbled. No. But Demers recovers it. He was down, his knee was down. Well, Jason, there is, there actually there are two sophomores in the game that I could say. Number six, Brian Ogden, number 45, Brian Dederno. But this is off the starting defensive line in there. Brian Ogden has actually been in the game throughout this game tonight, and he's been having a great game, and part of that great secondary for William Hills. So third and 11, five minutes remaining. Demarest on their own 45 yard line. Any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email the Wayne Hills TV Club at waynehillstv at yahoo.com. Once again, that is waynehillstv at yahoo.com. Well, I know what I was re really looking forward to tonight. The members of the marching band being part of the cheerleading squad. I talked to Matt Smodero today, who was part of the cheerleading squad for a sequence or two during the fourth quarter. And he said, quote, they were honored to have me, end quote. Dito took it himself on the last play and was Our mauled down, down by Mike Roman. By number, seven. number seven, actually, Eddie Roll. Well. Mike Roman assisted on the tackle. So just about four minutes here left in the fourth quarter. Mr. Ruffini is on the screen. Mr. He's a Ruff great man. My Mr. biology teacher freshman year. Mr. Ruffini, definitely a legend at Wayne Hills. Also a diehard Mets fan. Ugh, he just one loves your... David Wright. And I haven't talked to him yet this year, but I would have to guess that he's ecstatic about the Mets performance. Mike Giannetti to punt to Carlton Morrison and Dan DeSico who are at their own 30 yard line. The punt is high and over end. Marson to return and he waves her a fair catch. So Wayne Hills will start their next drive at their own 33 yard line as sophomores Christian Avedesian is in. I think this will be the last drive of the game. I think the Patriots are just gonna melt down the clock from here on out. That's why they call for fair catch. They just wanted to melt it off. Well, Andrew, I already got Jason's take on the Giants Redskins game this Sunday. Now I want your take. Well, they're home at the Meadowlands, so I am very confident. And my being a New York Giant fan, the defense this year, let's face it, has been disgusting. I've seen better high school defenses than the Giants defense. So I think the Giants are gonna come out with some fire. And I think they're gonna beat the Redskins. Seafree toss to number forty six Mark Kirk. To, to number forty six Mark Kirk. Good run there by Kirk, gain of 26 yards to the Demarest 40 yard line. Nice run there by Mark Kirk. He had a huge hole on the right side of the field and he really took advantage of it. But Andrew, back to the Giants. Do you think this Sunday is a must win for them? For the Giants? Yes. I think it is. I absolutely think it is. I, I really think that as good as the NFC East is this year, I think the Giants need to rack up as many wins as they can, and especially against a division foe in the Redskins, and this play's coming back. Holding there was against holding the against the Patriots. But back to your point, David, I think the defense this week's gonna have to make a statement against this Redskins offense. Because we saw last week, Reds, the Redskins offense, Santana Moss absolutely torched the Jacksonville Jaguars. I didn't mind that because he helped my fantasy team out, which propelled me to a victory against Max Henson, the first place team, which really gave me a good push in the power rankings. But I really think that the, yeah, the not the Yankees, the Giants are gonna come out with some fire. Seafree toss again to Kirk going from left to right. And he's got daylight, folks, and he's down at the Wayne Hills 42 yard line. Good run there yet again by Mark Kirk. Mark Kirk is showing me that he is a great player as we see the scoreboard, 48 to nothing Wayne Hills with 245 and counting remaining here. Wayne Hills looks to go to five and zero. Oh. 
Oh, look at that mascot dancing, getting jiggy with it over there on the sideline. The little Norseman, I guess you could say, shaking his behind. I mean, this is out of control, ladies and gents. This, this is a rare sight that, you know, you don't really see too often. I don't think Denver has so much to be thrilled about. They're losing 48 to nothing, but their mascot, he's showing a lot of enthusiasm on the Denver sideline. As you see, the Denver stands, not too many remain in the faithful. But I wanted to bring up another key NFL story. Terrell Owens returning to Lincoln Financial Field in a Dallas Cowboys uniform. Thoughts on that, guys? Brian Dawkins is going to get a nice juicy hit on Terrell Owens. Toss to Mark Kirk, gain him about five on the play. Jason, what are your thoughts on T.O. returning to Philly? Fox has been highlighting as, as a premier game for this week, for week six in the NFL. And you know what? I think it's going to be a great game. And I actually see the Dallas Cowboys prevailing over the Philadelphia Eagles. Look for Terrell Owens to make a big game and have a huge impact on that game. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Philadelphia Eagles, let me tell you something. Their defense, Jim Johnson's a guru. I'm sorry, folks. And I absolutely, you can ask Tom Gallo this. I absolutely despise the Cowboys. I hate the Cowboys oh, as, much, as much as I hate the Red Sox, I hate the Cowboys. I cannot stand that franchise. Well, I don't hate the Red Sox. Well, well, as much as you hate the Braves, you hate the Cowboys. And as much as I hate the Red Sox, I hate the Cowboys. Good analogy, David, that oh, you, yeah, as much as you hate the Braves. I hate the Yankees, too, so you can put that well, my point being is that the yeah. I just I hate Parcells. I hate Drew Bledsoe. I hate I hate Terrell Owens with a passion, mind you. I just I really have all faith in the Philadelphia Eagles winning this game and beating the Cowboys. Well, as a Giants fan, when you have two teams in the NFC East play, usually root for the team that has the lesser record, I guess you could call it. So I don't really know who to root for. But I'm really starting to hate the Eagles a lot. I really don't like their fans very much, and I think a lot of their players play the game See if dirty. See, toss to Evan Little, and he's stuffed at the 40-yard line. Dries Ronnie Dries, actually. Ronnie Dries getting some action, a sophomore. Ronnie Dries is a premier running back on the sophomore team for Wayne Hills, as well as Evan Little. Jake on the tackle for the Northmen. As there is... Five seconds remaining until Wayne Hills achieves a feat of going 5-0. and oh. And this game is over, folks. Wayne Hills improves to 5-0. and oh. Guys, what did you think of this game? Well, I was really impressed with Wayne Hills. They showed that even when they don't have their best night on offense, they could score on other sides of the ball. And that included special teams tonight. Dan DeSico had two punt returns for a touchdown. Carlton Marson had a punt return for a touchdown. And then also on a botch punt by Dooley, Kevin Barrick, I picked it up and returned it for a touchdown. And Dan DeSico was just dominant tonight. Four touchdowns, he was just fantastic. The defense did a great job containing Harrison Weiss and stopping the rushing attack. So kudos to everyone on the Wayne Hills football team. Well, the defense by far is outstanding. It's really... It's, it's something that a lot of people question going into this season and last season, actually, that how the running attack was just not there and how it's all, it's all garbage. Let's just face it. The Wayne Hills defense is one of the best in the state of New Jersey. Offensively, today, they had some jitter, you know, against the Denver Norsemen, but, you know, they went out there. They played very well. And special teams, Wally Johnson, you should be proud. You have a great unit. Coach Olsen did a great job coaching tonight, as he always does. 48 nothing. It was a complete effort by the Patriots. You have a great point about that defense for Wayne Hill. Scott Schultz, Matt Johnson, Dave Ogden. Their defense is just great. For Andrew Gallo, David Suntup, Spencer Furtick, and Matt DeBow. And Kyle Critique, Sean Yu, and Brian Rossman. I'm Jason Oliphant signing off. Have a good night, everyone.